All right, welcome everybody. And a uh, little bit of housekeeping item before we get started. Uh, this is the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment. This evening this will be our clause by clause review of Bill 34, Mineral Resources Act. Um, clearly this is a different setting than what we're used to. And so I want to welcome everybody. We uh, seem to have a, a nice larger public audience tonight, which it's always nice to have at a clause by clause review. So thank you for that. Um, also, our audio is a little bit different this evening and our visual obviously is a little bit different, but we are being broadcasted and we're used to having an awesome um, audio tech uh, turn our mics off and on. So for this evening, it'll be up to each person to turn their mics off and on as they're speaking. Um, but like normal, we'll go through the chair. So uh, to get us started, everyone, I will get us started with a prayer. So I'll ask that everybody stand. Lord, we thank you for this day and the many blessings we have received. We thank you for the ability to use our minds and work together to create strong and healthy communities. We thank you for looking over our constituents and all who we serve. Lord, we pray for all in our communities who are hungry, who are ill, and those who live in violence. As this meeting begins, Lord, please provide each person here with clarity of mind, creativity, compassion, integrity, and a sense of humor. Lord, give us listening ears, thoughtful words, and an open heart as we meet here today. Amen. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, members for the record to introduce themselves, and I'll start on my far left. Hi, R.J. Simpson, MLA, Hay River North. Good evening, Kieran Testard, MLA for Cam Lake. I think we should do these always in the Great Hall if we always get this kind of turnout. So. Good evening, uh, welcome, Danny McNeely, SAW2. Uh, Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. And my name is Corey Vanthine. I am the uh, MLA for Yellowknife North and the chair of the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment. We also have our staff with us this evening on my far left is uh, Sheila McPherson, our law clerk. On my immediate left is Kathleen Knuch, our committee researcher. On my right is our committee clerk uh, acting is <laughs> Glenn Rutland. And on my far right is uh, Clerk trainee, uh, Cynthia James. So without further ado, today the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment is holding a public clause by clause review of Bill 34, the Miner Mineral Resources Act. Bill 34, Mineral Resources Act, is to establish new legislation that will guide how mining and mineral exploration and production will happen in the NWT, require engaging indigenous governments and organizations, including on where no mineral development will be allowed and where it will be encouraged, require new benefit agreements for indigenous governments and organizations for mines of a certain size, and set royalty rates based on how much the mine produces. Bill 34 received second reading in the Legislative Assembly on February 12, 2019, and was referred to the Standing Committee on Economic Development for review. The committee sent letters inviting input from an extensive list of stakeholders, including municipal and indigenous governments in the Northwest Territories, as well as a number of non-governmental organizations and stakeholders. The committee traveled throughout the territory and held public hearings in Inuvik, Norman Wells, and Yellowknife. The committee thanks everyone who attended these meetings or provided written submissions sharing their views on Bill 34. There are copies of the bills available at the back of the room. The committee would also like to thank the Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment and his staff for the collaborative approach on the review of Bill 34. Through our consultations and deliberations, it was clear that there were areas where improvements were necessary and the committee is pleased to be bringing forward amendments that will improve this bill and create better legislation for the residents of the Northwest Territories. I will now invite the Honourable Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment to introduce your, yourself and your staff for the record and proceed with any opening remarks you may have. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for inviting me this evening to speak to you and the members of the committee regarding Bill 34, the Mineral Resource Act. 
I'd like to introduce the officials here with me this evening. They are here to help provide technical details if questions arise, and they are Deputy Minister of Industry, Tourism and Investment, Tom Jensen, Assistant Deputy Minister of Minerals and Petroleum Resources with the Department of Industry, Tourism and Investment, Pamela Strand, Senior Legislative Advisor with the Department of Industry, Tourism and Investment, Laura Farina, Kelly McLaughlin, Legislative Counsel for the Department of Justice, and also with me is Director of Policy, Planning and Communications and Analyst Evan Wall and my Ministerial Special Advisor, Megan Birch. This bill is part of the government's work to improve the Northwest Territories land and resource management regime to ensure Northerners are able to make decisions that support sustainable, responsible development and protection of the environment while respecting Indigenous rights. I would like to speak, to, I'd like to speak with you about the purpose of the proposed Mineral Resource Act and our vision for what it can achieve. First and foremost, this legislation is a foundation upon which our management of mineral industry can be built. It is the defining goal is to give our government's ability to respond to the wants and needs of our people, bring clarity and certainty where it is lacking, and modernize, modernize how we govern mineral resources and codify the current best practices. The new authorities proposed in this act will give us the ability to set regulations to match those ambitions. We believe the Mineral Resource Act defines the vision of managing exploration and mining in a way that makes sure Northwest Territories residents benefit, fosters positive relationships, and advance public interest while maintaining a balanced approach. Contained within this bill are provisions which would ensure benefits for Indigenous governments and organizations for major mining projects. It is our firm belief that it is good policy to codify our territory's long-standing commitment to bringing benefits to Indigenous communities from resource projects. While this is a first in legislation for Canada, the intent is to simply to translate the practice of negotiating with Indigenous governments which mining companies are either already doing or expected to do in some form wherever they do business into the letter of the law. The bill also addresses benefit generating tools for all Northwest Territories residents. This will clarify an approach that exists in practice through our existing social economic agreements and provide the flexibility to allow evolution of these agreements or the use of other appropriate tools to generate benefits for the territory in the future. Indigenous governments, communities, public governments and those looking to do business here there are measures in this bill which will benefit each of them as they work to build mutually beneficial relationships in the mining industry. We believe this bill will encourage early engagement, better communication and predictable dispute resolution. This bill defines the new authorities for reducing conflict by addressing gaps around sensitive lands and local awareness amongst those exploring for minerals. The MRA will enable our exploration regime to move into the 21st century with online map staking. This will actually help facilitate improved communication and transparency once implemented. And we recognize that geological information is key and that a whole lot of it is collected through the mineral exploration to mining activities. This bill would give us the authorities to collect more geoscience information through all stages of the mineral development cycle. Such measures would add to our understanding of the territory's geology, and when that information gets made public, it has the potential to encourage economic development in the future. The Act also respects the need for responsible confidentiality to protect commercial interests. This bill, this bill is one of the most significant pieces of legislation introduced in the Northwest Territory since devolution in 2014. The process for the development reflected that stature. The department comp completed extensive legislative research and multi-platform engagement campaign where the public, Indigenous governments, industry, NGOs and other interested stakeholders were invited to comment. Feedback from those on this committee and close collaboration with intergovernmental council throughout the policy development process. The department pr produced and promoted plain language materials to assist in informing the public. The Department of Industry, Tourism and Investment has worked with the legal division of the Department of Justice on this bill. The department has been clear that many regulations along with accompanying awareness materials must be completed to bring provisions to this act into force should it pass. We are committed to moving forward in the spirit of collaboration with our partners on the Intergovernmental Council, industry and all our affected stakeholders and we recognize how important that collaboration will be in getting this implementation right. 
This will be a phased approach with provisions coming into force with appropriate notice as they are developed. This is consistent with Monk's other jurisdictions that have done similar overhauls on their mining legislation. I wish to comment, commend the committee on their continued engagement with the public as this bill is moved through the legislative process. It is an important bill and I appreciate how much time and effort has been dedicated by all parties and I hope the plain language materials our department produced and promoted since introduction were helpful in informing the public. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I look forward to hearing the committee's comments and welcome any questions members may have. Thank you, Minister, for your opening comments. I just remind you to manage the mic there. So at this time, we'll turn it over to committee. Does committee have any general comments or questions before we begin the clause by clause review? Committee, Mr. O'Reilly. Sorry, I forgot to turn it on. Um, I have some general comments. I don't want to repeat what I've said when uh, second reading, but uh, I do want to focus on um, what the minister has in his opening remarks. He talks um, on the fourth and final page about providing appropriate notice um, as further phases of this rolls out. Can someone explain what that really means and whether there will be an opportunity for the public to comment on draft regulations? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Mr. Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm trying to see exactly where it says that, but I know I remember the conversation we had before around regulations development, and I've always said that the 19th, 19th Legislative Assembly will make those decisions how regulations will be determined and who will be involved in, in that process. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So I'll try to help the minister here. It's on the fourth page. Second paragraph, uh, this will be a phased process with provisions coming into force with appropriate notice as they are developed. So what does this appropriate notice really mean? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That will be a public process once our definitions are designed as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Okay, thanks, Mr. Chair. So we received input from a whole variety of uh, uh, parties, including Indigenous governments, industry, NGOs. There's obviously very strong public interest in this bill and the, these matters. Part of the issue, our problem may be that a lot of the details are left to regulations to come into the future. People in general have asked for an opportunity to comment on draft regulations. Is that something that's going to happen? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Schumann. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. As I said, uh, the process is going to have to be defined at the end of the day by the 19th Legislative Assembly, but we will share as much information that we, that we, public, that we about the process moving forward, but the 19th Legislative Assembly is going to have to make that decision. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Well, I think we may have some motions or amendments to the bill that will attempt to uh, remedy this situation of providing some certainty and clarity. So I'm not going to flog this one any further, but uh, um, I do have a number of other issues and uh, concerns, questions, and I think I'll, it's probably just most appropriate that I raise those as we go through the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate that. Thank you. Next, I have Mr. McNeely. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just want to um, quote a study then that I never forgot that was dated on June the 6th, 2016. The NWT residents show strong support for mining. Northwest Territories residents have made it clear that they overwhelmingly support mining in the NWT. According to a survey conducted by the Abacus Data, a national research company, 
commissioned by the NWT Chamber of Mines and uh, the Mining Association of Canada. Just to highlight rather than go through the whole thing, uh, some highlights, 86% uh, believe a strong mining sector is vital to the health of the NWT economy. 86% of the survey says mining is good for the NWT. 82% would like to see more mining projects. And for myself, for myself, I feel privileged here in drafting legislation here on the post-devolution phase of what we inherited on Devolution Day, April the 1st, 2014 a piece of legislation, as we've always said over the last several months and several weeks and several years, made in the North, for the North, by the North. So uh, I feel privileged in assisting in drafting this legislation. look forward to moving on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Next I have Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We all know that mining in the territories is in an upswing not this territory, the other two. And so this is a very important piece of legislation because it has been, mining has been, investment has been declining for over a decade now. And this is probably the most important uh, piece of legislation that we're bringing forward, this assembly. And so I want to make sure that we're getting it right. Um, I, I see that uh, the members spoke about the phased approach that, we're take, that the, the department wants to take and that that will be up to the 19th assembly. And yet there seemed to be a rush to get the bill passed in this assembly. Um, and I don't quite understand that logic. Um, and I know there was a, a co-drafting process and I think that uh, it's a model that the world can follow. You know, I think that this is uh, something that, that we have to be proud of. But it seems to me that despite that, this bill was brought to us half finished and I wonder why was the, the, the bill brought at this point and not when some of the, the issues that are, are quite glaring, in my opinion, were addressed? Like we have a part five in here, which I think is, you know, it, 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 it could be world class. The idea of legislating in, uh, benefit agreements, you know, that is, um, you know, that's reconciliation and that is, uh, that's a recognition of, of whose land this is. But the way it's drafted in the bill, it seems like it's half done. And when you have something that has no clarity to it, it makes people nervous. And, you know, people in the territory are aware of how things work in the territory. People who've done work here know that. But when mines need to attract investors from around the world who have no idea about the Northwest Territories, they see legislation like this and it can scare them. And I think that more time could have been spent with the IGOs uh, hashing that out a bit more so that there is more clarity. So why was the bill brought forward in this state and not left to the 19th, you know, the, why wasn't there a couple more years spent on the bill uh, in, and have it released in the 19th when the regulations are supposed to be, you know, worked on by the 19th. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Minister Schumann. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I don't think this bill is uh, anywhere near what the member is referring to, that it's not ready. I believe this bill is, is certainly ready for it to be brought forward. Plus, it's something that all of us that are sitting around this table and our mandate commitments brought forward and agreed to in the Assembly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Simpson. Thank you. So, uh, I, I guess uh, when this was being co-drafted, was there any uh, appetite on behalf of anyone to, to flesh out sections such as Part 5? Or was everyone completely content that... Uh, as bare bones as it is that it was, it was appropriate uh, to be released to the world. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, let's make it quite clear, this wasn't co-drafted. Um, this was a cooperation with us and Indigenous governments. We worked very closely with them based on what we signed with Devolution, that they would be involved in on the co-development of moving all our legislation forward based around resources in the Northwest Territories and based on our discussions with Intergovernmental Council the public, industry, and with committee, I believe that uh, this is a, a very good bill that we're bringing forward, and we've worked very closely with the committee, and there's, as people are going to see tonight, there's a number of changes that were made based on your guys' input, 
And uh, with that, I'm very comfortable bringing this to the floor of the House. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister. Further, Mr. Simpson? Nothing further, thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, I have Mr. Testart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do want to comment on how important the co-drafting process is. Uh, it's come up before with this committee's work on the suite of um, land and resource bills that we have reviewed. And um, when we hear from stakeholders that co-drafting is uh, basically an, a remedy to generations of colonialism, um, it's an important consideration we have to consider when, when a standing committee like ours takes a bill that was co-drafted. And that's not lost on me. I was very careful in my review of this bill, carefully weighing the evidence, weighing the testimony we heard when we consulted on the bill and uh, evaluating the sections. And I was pleased to work on, with the committee and the minister on a number of amendments that, uh, and changes to the bill that we'll discuss later. Um, but I share my colleagues' concerns about, uh, in particular, part five. And the reason I disagree with the minister, I think fundamentally, um, in that when we have evidence as a committee that the intention around part five was to leave it intentionally vague and to plug that gap with regulations. And this occurred to the committee's mind as soon as we first started looking at the bill. So when we traveled around the territory and communicated, uh, or and were consulting with um, Northerners, and in particular with co-drafting Indigenous uh, governments and Indigenous organizations, we, I always made sure to ask them, you know, what's your perspective on part five? Because there's a lot of concerns out there, in particular from industry. And each hearing, we got a different interpretation of part five from the co-drafters. Now, as we kind of circled around, it became, a, there, there seemed to be more consistency coming from that approach. But, you know, these benefit agreements could have been a brand new thing. They could have been codifying existing practice. They could have been um, uh, something, you know, uh, something undefined, but meant something important to the IGO proponent at the table. So I completely agree with my colleague, Mr. Simpson, that, you know, this section was not clarified before it was brought forward to committee. And, um, you know, since that point, we've received some, some pretty serious concerns from both the public um, and from the industry. Uh, this, this section doesn't only relate to um, impact or benefit agreements with indigenous governments, but it also relates to benefits to the people of the Northwest Territories. And that section is even less defined. And in fact, uh, the timelines for that could leave it open up to every part of the mineral cycle from exploration to production to remediation. And I think if, if, you know, if you extrapolate that, that's a huge sea change for how we handle socioeconomic agreements, benefit agreements. And to leave that so vague and so wide open, I think that's a, a huge concern for, for proponents who might want to be investing in the Northwest Territories. And I'm not saying that, this, this, that, that Part 5 is a bad idea. Any bill needs to be as clear as possible with the regulations set up in a very predictable and reliable way. When we are told, when we have different interpretations of the bill from co-drafting par parties, and the, the government tells us, no, no, it's intentionally vague, that, that leaves me with serious concerns. And we've worked, we've done our best to work on improving this and adding clarity to the section. Um, and I'm not sure if we've accomplished that. But um, in that being said, I, I do support the process that was used to create this bill, but we have a process here too, a role as a standing committee, to make sure that the, this, this, this final form of the bill is as perfect as it possibly can be and benefits the most amount of, of uh, Northerners as possible. And I don't think we're there yet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Testart. To that, Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So when we get to, uh, I'm not gonna comment right now on the comments made by the member, but when we get to, uh, to uh, the part five of the bill, I have a statement that I'm gonna read out that's gonna clearly lay out where we think part five lies. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister. And just, you know, for some reason, if I don't, um, if I kind of mistakenly pass by, make sure you flag me in the appropriate way. But we do have a procedure that we're gonna follow. Just one moment.
Thank you. Okay, at this point, does committee agree to conduct clause by clause review of Bill 34, Minerals Act? Committee agree? As we move uh, forward and I ask for the agreeds, maybe you should. Uh, Mr. Chair, would you like to vote by show of hand? Or I recommend we vote by show of hand. That'll be maybe the process that we're going to use then. We'll use vote, uh, show of hand tonight. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, committee. We will defer the title of the bill until the end and begin with consideration of the clauses. There are 116 clauses in the bill. So where possible, we will group clauses. So I'm going to ask committee to please turn to page nine of the bill. Clause one, Mr. McNeely. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I move that clause one of Bill 34 be amended by deleting the, the definition, brackets, mining rights panel, brackets, and adding the following definition in alphabetical order. Mineral rights review board means the Mineral Rights Review Board established under Section 10. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. We're sort of in the unusual position where members of the public can't even, they do not have copies of the motions and that's the way our procedure works. When we're in the small committee room, you can actually see the motions as they come forward on a screen. So I do feel some duty to explain what we're doing here. Um, what's happening is uh, the mining rights panel as uh, conceived in the bill is going to be replaced by something called the Mineral Rights Review Board. Unfortunately, I can't speak to the, the nature of that, but we are going to get to that. But uh, this is simply a name change and there's uh, some other changes to the way that uh, mining rights um, dispute resolution will be handled and we're going to get to that as we go down into the bill. But, uh, um, and I think it does address a, a number of the concerns raised by uh, stakeholders that uh, made representations to the committee. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. To the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept it. The minister concurs with this amendment. Thank you, Minister. Committee to Clause 1 as amended. Does committee agree? Thank you. Committee Clauses 2 through 6. Does committee agree? Thank, thank you. Committee to Clause 7. Mr. Testart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that Clause 7 of Bill 34 be amended A in subclause 1 by striking out recorded by a mining recorder under this Act and the regulations and substituting publicly accessible under subsection 3 and any other information required to be recorded under this Act and the regulations and B by adding the following after subclause 2. Three, the registry required under subsection one shall have a public component consisting of documents that shall be publicly accessible, which must contain the following information. A, any appointments made under subsection six one. B, any de delegations made under subsection six four, including any limitations, terms, and conditions of those delegations. C, any appointments made under subsection 8.1 D, any delegations made under subsection 8.2, including any limitations, terms, and conditions of those delegations. E, any authorizations made pursuant to, sub, to section 9. F, any appointments made under subsection 10.2. G, any delegations made under sub, section 13, including any limitations, terms, and conditions of those delegations. H, any designations, revocations, or extensions of restricted areas made under section 22, and any reasons for decision made under subsection 22.7.1. Sub I, any orders made under subsection 23.3, and any waivers made under subsection uh, 
uh, 23.6, J, any zones established under subsection 24.2, K, any written reasons required by subsection 24.9, L, any prospector's licenses issued under subsection 26.3. M, any notices required to be given under subsection 28.4. N, any state claims recorded under subsection 28.6. Any transfers of recorded claims made under section 31. And any reduced area claims recorded under subsection 32.2. O, any suspensions or cancellations of recorded claims made under section 33. P, any notices of protest filed under subsection 35.1. Q, any written reasons made under subsection 35.4. R, any mineral leases issued under subsection 37.2. Any renewals under subsection 38.2. Any suspensions or cancellations under section 39. And any transfers under section 40. S, any licenses issued under subsection 46.3, any transfers of licenses under section 47, and any cancellations or suspensions of licenses under section 48. T, any waivers granted by the minister under subsection 52.3 or 4. U, any determinations made in respect of a review under part 9. V, any appointments made under subsection 68.1. W, any orders made under section 72. X, any suspensions, cancellations, or prohibitions made under section 106. And finally, Y, any other prescribed information. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Testart. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. Testart. I have the mic anyway. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this, uh, this amendment creates a public registry, and that's, that was a very long amendment that just basically lays out what needs to be uh, published in that registry, and that will be available and accessible to the public. And in reviewing all of the post-devolution bills, the committee uh, felt very strongly that public registries needed to be a component of each of them, and this follows through with other amendments that we have uh, raised previously. And, um, and I think this is a, a, a much needed mechanism to shed uh, transparency and uh, accountability on the decisions that are made under this new act. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Testart, to the motion. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I support this motion and uh, I'd like to say at least a couple of things about it. What committee did was uh, carefully go through the bill to find uh, decision points. Um, permits, licenses, authorizations that would be issued and try to ensure that those would be uh, on a public registry available for the public to uh, see and have access to. So we, all of these numbers and so on, they do refer to decision points or within the, uh, the mineral rights uh, system that will come into place once the bill's in place. Um, secondly, I guess um, uh, the information will be made public, but there may be some parts of it that are withheld and we're going to get to uh, some reasons or uh, provisions around that in, in some uh, subsequent motions here. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. To the motion. To the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion has been carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we accept this. The motion builds a public component to the registry and lists the document classes that must be housed in the public component. Thank you. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause seven as amended. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I have one additional motion here. The clause seven of bill 34 be amended by the following after paragraph three R, R1. Any notice of intended work filed under subsection 42.1 and any waivers made under subsection 42.4. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So I think it's fair to say that the last motion established a public component of a, a registry and a committee went back and forth with the department and the minister on what was appropriate to be filed. The purpose of this amendment would be to include notice of intended work, which is found in the bill in uh, 42.1. So this is uh, the idea that um, when work is going to be conducted on a uh, uh, mineral claim or a lease, um, there's some kind of a description of the work program, and work has a very general, broad meaning under the, the Act in terms of things like drilling and trenching and those sort of things. 
but essentially there would be a notice of what the work program is going to look like maybe for the next year. And this is, I think, a, a helpful um, thing, uh, uh, subject to the, the, this notice of intended work. It does make some small inroads into the concept of free entry, uh, but it's also just doing business and making sure that your neighbors are aware of what you're going to be doing out there. So the exact requirements for uh, the intended work are going to be set out in regulations and presumably will involve some uh, level of public consultation. Um, some of the information uh, around mineral exploration is obviously confidential, but I think any good neighbour would want to know wh whether there's going to be a drilling rig in their backyard or not. And uh, so the, the purpose here is to make sure that once the, uh, the intended work requirements are laid out and agreed upon, that that, uh, be, that notice of the intended work makes its way onto the public registry. Right now in the bill, that notice of intended work, there are provisions in here for that information to be provided to Indigenous governments. That's great, and that's the way it should be to help build better relationships, better neighbours. The, the intent of this motion is to allow for the public to see that. Uh, this is the case in Ontario now. It is the case in Quebec. That's how those jurisdictions they have gone through extensive reviews of their mineral rights legislation. That's how it's done in those jurisdictions. And I hope that uh, uh, my fellow committee members and the minister and his will agree that this is something that can and should be done in the interest of building better relationships, greater transparency, public disclosure. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly, to the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed, the motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? No, we do not, and for the following reasons. The department developed the notices of intent to work sections closely and work closely with the Intergovernmental Council Secretary and the Technical Advisory Panel. The notice of intended work was included in the bill to address particular concerns of IGOs. IGOs put forward that they should be aware of, of what, happen, what, what may be happening in their settlement areas or traditional territories. Moreover, industry representatives emphasized that exploration requires flexibility to adjust plans. They also expressed concern about confidentiality. In recognition of that feedback, the department has made no commitments to make the notices of intended work more widely disclosed than the relevant IGOs until further engagement with IGOs and industry can be undertaken during the development of regulations. We believe it is worthwhile to allow more time to analyze the most advisable scope of disclosure and confidentiality. Without respecting the need for balance, this section would create greater conflict instead of reducing conflict. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister. The Minister does not concur with the amendment. The amendment will not take effect as a result. Committee 2, Clause 7 as amended. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I move that Bill 34 be amended by adding the following after subclause 73. Four, that the public component of the registry required under subsection 3 must be made available to the public by posting it on a website or through another online electronic publication that is available in the Northwest Territories and information that is required to be included in the public component must be posted in a timely manner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So what this motion does is uh, set out the form of the public registry, that it's to be on a website maintained by the department, uh, and that it's to include the information that can be made available to the public, and that it should be uh, posted there in a timely manner so that things don't sit around. Uh, and I think this is a helpful amendment. and. Uh, it's similar to some of the language that we've developed in other uh, resource management bills that have come before this committee, including the uh, Protected Areas Act. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to Clause 7 as amended. Mr. Simpson. 
Mr. Chair, I move that Bill 34 be amended by adding the following after subclause 745. Nothing in this act requires a document to be included in the registry under subsection 3 that A is or may be prohibited from disclosure under any other act in the Northwest Territories or Canada or B contains information that is provided implicitly or explicitly in confidence to a person or body exercising powers or performing duties or functions under this act and is consistently treated as confidential information by the party providing the information. Thank you. Thank you. The motion is in order. To the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? Yes, we do. The minister concurs with this amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause seven as amended. Does committee agree? Thank you. <coughs> committee clauses eight and nine. Does committee agree? Agreed. Committee clause 10. Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that sub clause 10 brackets one of bill 34 be amended by striking out brackets mining rights panel and substituting brackets mineral rights review board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, the motion is in order to the motion. Question has been called, all those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried, does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept it. Thank you, the minister concurs with this amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to Clause 10 as amended, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just before we, I get into the motion, I'd like to ask the uh, Minister if I could, uh, now that this has been renamed a, a Mining Rights uh, Board, M Mining Mineral Rights Review Board, I'd like to know from the Minister, was any thought given to establishing this as uh, a co-management approach where Indigenous governments could appoint half the, the panel or the half the board and uh, GNWT would appoint the other half. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have the eligibility appointments there and as they're listed out there, we would, we would uh, you know, have a look at all the nominations going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I understand that the minister can make the appointments. I'm just wondering if any thought was given to establishing this as a, a co-management, through a co-management approach, as is, uh, has been done through land rights agreements, where Indigenous governments would appoint half or nominate half of the uh, members, and uh, GNWT would nominate, or, or the minister would appoint the, the other half as well. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. When we looked at this thing, this has got to be merit-based and expertise is necessary, so that's why we've laid it out the way we have in the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly, nothing further to the motion. Uh, thanks, oh, uh, Mr. Chair. Well, I'm not sure I accept the minister's explanation, but I would like to move that clause, uh, subclause 10-2 of Bill 34 be deleted in the following substituted to the minister shall appoint at least four members to the Mineral Rights Review Board and shall designate one of those members to be the chairperson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order. To the motion, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. So uh, this and I think some of the subsequent motions here are about basically transforming this mineral rights panel into an actual board and providing for a greater number of individuals that can and should serve on it and uh, actually hear the dispute resolutions uh, that are brought forward, the disputes that are heard brought forward. So uh, I think we have some other amendments further down into the bill that to help clarify the roles and responsibilities of those who will actually hear the disputes. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To the motion. Question, Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept it. Thank you. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 10 as amended. Mr. O'Reilly. 
Thanks, Mr. Chair. That I move that Bill 34 be amended in that portion of subclause 10.3, preceding paragraph A, by striking out mining rights panel and substituting mineral rights review board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Motion is in order to the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Does the min or sorry, uh, the motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept it. Okay, thank you. The minister concurs with the amendment. Committee two, clause 10 as amended. Mr. Testart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that clause 10 of Bill 34 be amended by adding the following after subclause 3. For a member of the Mineral Rights Review Board holds office for a term of up to three years as specified in the appointment and may be reappointed for additional terms but may not hold office for more than three consecutive terms unless the minister considers additional terms for that member to be in the public interest. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. Testart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this amendment seeks to uh, clarify t or to establish some sort of limitation on the terms of those appointed to the Mineral Rights Review Board. The committee felt it was important to um, ensure that there was some uh, routine turnover on the board and they weren't indefinite appointments. And uh, in working with the minister, we felt that we struck an appropriate balance between acknowledging that uh, capacity can be challenging in the north, so this does allow a bit of uh, flexibility in retaining uh, qualified people on this board, but still ensuring that there are uh, there's some degree of term limits. Thank you. Thank you. To the motion. Question, Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 10 as amended. Mr. Simpson. I move that clause 10 of Bill 34 be amended by adding the following after subclause 4. 5. A member of the Mineral Rights Review Board may not be designated as a chairperson for more than three consecutive years. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. Simpson. Similar to the last uh, motion, this is to avoid stagnation that we sometimes see on boards in the Northwest Territories. Thank you. Thank you to the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 10 as amended. Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that clause 10 of Bill 34 be amended by adding the following after subclause brackets 5, 6, the Mineral Rights Review Board shall, eat, shall each year in accordance with any prescribed requirements prepare an annual report and submit it to the minister. 7, the minister shall cause cause a copy of the uh, annual report prepared under s subsection 6 and or excuse me to be laid before the to be laid before the legislative assembly at the earliest opportunity after receiving the report thank you mr chair thank you the motion is in order to the motion mr o'reilly thanks mr chair so um when committee was going through the bill, uh, we tried to find, um, as we, I mentioned earlier, a number of uh, decision points and uh, places where uh, annual reports and uh, public that could be filed on the public registry, and we thought we could put it in there, but uh, rightfully so, that the Mineral Rights Review Board is actually an independent body, so. Committee has uh, built in the requirement for uh, an annual report to be produced, and I think that's uh, uh, just in the public interest, ensure, ensuring transparency and accountability. Uh, so that will, the board now will produce that annual report, give it to the minister, the minister will now table it in the house, so uh, everybody can see what uh, the uh, rates review board has been up to and how much they're spending and what, uh, and so on and so on. So. Uh, that's the purpose of this amendment. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. Thank you. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. 
Committee to Clause 10 as amended. Does the committee agree? Thank you. Committee to Clause Clauses 11 to 16. Does the committee agree? Thank you. Clauses 17 to 21. Does the committee agree? Thank you. Clause 22. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So there are provisions in the, uh, the bill for uh, what's called designation of risk. Oh, sorry, I move, Mr. Chair, that paragraph 22.2b of Bill 34 be amended in each of the subparagraphs, Roman numeral 1 and Roman numeral 2, by striking out or historical and substituting historical or municipal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so the bill establishes a uh, process where there can be uh, what's called restricted areas established. And these are um, areas where there can be a temporary um, withdrawal of mining rights for a period that's up to two years. And this, uh, of course, was done at the request of Indigenous governments to uh, allow for you know, temporary protection of things like unique archaeological, cultural, ecological, geological, uh, or historical significance. Um, so the idea was that there could be a temporary restriction of some sort. The purpose of amending this to include municipal is to eventually, uh, and there will be some other amendments that will follow, is to extend this uh, ability for um, the designation of uh, temporary or temporary restricted areas by the minister to include areas that have some municipal purpose. And this would allow um, local governments to, and we're gonna get to it, uh, protect municipal infrastructure, whether it's water, sewer, uh, dumps and so on, municipal quarries, uh, so that those areas can receive some measure of uh, temporary protection while uh, decision might be made about longer term protection. So that's why the, uh, the definition of these restricted areas, the suggestion in the motion is that that should be extended to include uh, municipal purposes. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. To the motion, Mr. Testart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, this is a, a really crucial motion. Um, <clears throat> it is perhaps as significant as any other issue that has been raised um, in our review of the bill. Uh, municipalities um, or the the challenges that municipalities have interacting with the mineral rights regime are uh, not hypothetical they have occurred and we received direct um, submissions from one community in particular around this so the effort here is to give them some form of tool to address that concern uh, so when there are conflicts so a municipality can e easily designate um, a public asset or something that's in, that, that they want off limits for their purposes and it's under a kind of short term restriction until things can be sorted out. And that prevents the kind of difficulties that we've seen in Inuvik with their quarry, where, where their quarry was staked and uh, it resulted in a protracted legal dispute. Um, we, we already know it's a reality, so this is the ideal way to fix it uh, by putting some flexibility into the act. Um, and uh, this is one of those amendments that will enable that. And I think it's very important to respect local governments and empower them to make good decisions around their communities. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To the motion. To the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. We are unable to accept this motion as currently presented. This motion is not consistent with the intent of this provision, which is to protect sensitive areas for the set amount of time to find long-term land use solutions. Moreover, restricted areas are justified by unique attributes, fra fragile attributes that could face irreparable harm, significance tied to ethical values rather than public utilities or economic worth, urgent need for temporary protection until long-term measures may be secured. Municipal infrastructure is, none of, is not any of these things. 
In particular, municipal infrastructure is not in need of an interim protection pending a long-term solution because the Surface Rights Board has jurisdiction since devolution to address this dispute. We envision this as a tool which will be particularly useful for Indigenous governments to protect areas of vital importance when new information arises. Municipalities have every right to petition the minister should there be land within their boundaries they believe requires such an intervention under the existing provision. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister. The minister does not concur with the amendment. The amendment will not take effect as a result. Committee to Clause 22, Mr. Testart. Yeah, thank you. So um, I'm just reflecting on the minister's uh, comments on uh, on that on what had just, just occurred. Um, can he explain which what remedies currently exist in the act? Because to my knowledge, there are none that would allow a municipality to designate area that's off limits from uh, staking, for for example. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Testart. Minister Schumann. What I could say is that restricted area provisions is not designated to protect things like municipal infrastructure, which are planned projects where existing issues can be studied and addressed. Infrastructure location and nature is planned and known. There is a time to use existing tools to apply for protection to ensure access, land use planning, offers appropriate tools to address the protected areas that have interests, interests like municipalities of infrastructure, if there is a surface access issue, that should be dealt with under the legislature because the MRA does not govern surface rates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testart? Uh, so, th thank you. So, um, so, hypothetically, and you have your witnesses there, so I, I think you'll be able to answer this even though it might be detailed, but the occurrence that, again, we, have, we, we know has occurred in Inuvik where staking was taking place on a, on a quarry, on a municipal quarry that was owned by Member, the community. Member, interject, you Sorry. can't pose hypothetical questions. I'll ask you to rephrase your question. Okay. So, could the town of Inuvik use an existing remedy within this legislation to resolve the quarry situation in Inuvik, and if so, which remedy as exists in the act? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Will, the Schumann? Will, will the chair allow the member to describe the situation? Thank you, Minister. To the best of your ability, Mr. Testart. Yes. Um, uh, mineral rights or a claim of mineral rights or staking was was applied to a quarry in a municipal quarry in the town of Inuvik and it resulted in a protracted legal dispute over ownership rights of a municipal asset or what, what began as a municipal asset. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Farina. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I understood this to be an access issue, and um, in terms of that, for a mineral claim, a mineral claim doesn't govern surface rights. So I think that uh, in terms of that kind of dispute, it should be under surface legislation, surface rights legislation. If you are um, discussing, that's why I'm, thank you for describing the issue. If you're uh, discussing quarrying rights versus mineral rights, I think that um, that's a good point to make and maybe we should be looking that, at that in terms of the quarrying regulations and how they relate to um, the regulations under this act, not necessarily a municipal specific issue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, anything further, Mr. Testart? Nothing further, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I think we've opened up a bit of a can of worms here. So I think um, I heard that the minister say that the Surface Rights Board would have jurisdiction if there's some sort of dispute. And that, that is true. But what this is about is trying to prevent a dispute in the first place from happening by giving a, a, a community government the ability to request a temporary restriction on areas 
uh, where they have key municipal infrastructure. This is about avoiding land use conflicts. Uh, once there's a conflict in place, it's too late. <laughs> uh, that's, and the Surface Rights uh, Board would have jurisdiction, uh, as was said, but the Surface Rights Board cannot stop the activity, the, the mineral uh, exploration from happening. All they can do is provide compensation, uh, which is not very good if you're a municipal government and your water intake has been destroyed by uh, mineral exploration. I hope we never get to that kind of situation, but that's what this is about, is preventing that kind of conflict from happening in the first place. And I, I see in the, the bill that there is the ability for Indigenous governments to uh, make such requests for restricted areas, but municipal governments are not included. So can't we find a way to uh, help avoid land use disputes or conflicts from happening in the first place? That's what this is about. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, that's more of a comment. To the comment, comment noted. We know the minister does not concur with the amendment. The amendment will not take effect as a result. Committee to Clause 22, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I move that Clause 22 of Bill 34 be amended by the following after subclause 3, 3.1. In a case where a proposed restricted area is within or overlaps with the settlement lands or the asserted traditional territory of an Indigenous government or organization, the Minister may, in the Minister's discretion and in accordance with the regulations, prohibit the issuance of interests in minerals in respect of the proposed restricted area or prospecting, exploring or staking a claim within the proposed restricted area pending the decision to designate a restricted area under subsection 2, 3.2. A decision of the Minister under subsection 3.1 is final and may not be appealed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So this is um, sort of analogous to a situation that uh, arose in committee's mind around uh, the protected areas process where there might be a request for a temporary uh, designation or a nomination of, a, of an area. I think is that that legislation uses. And while that nomination is being considered, uh, the concern was that uh, someone may go in and acquire um, uh, exploration uh, subsurface rights in that area while it's being considered. What this does is when there's a request for a restricted area, the <coughs> minister has the ability that's somewhat <laughs> uh, full of lots of discretion as to whether that area should receive interim protection while a decision is being made even on the temporary restriction for two years. So that's what the purpose of this is um, and that if the minister does make a decision around this interim protection for a restricted area that the decisions, uh, the minister's decision is final. Thanks Mr. Chair. Thank you to the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 22 as amended. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Chair, I move that clause 22 of Bill 34 be amended by adding the following after subclause 7. 7.1. The minister shall provide written reasons for the designation of a restricted area under subsection 2 upon request to any indigenous governments or organizations that proposed the area for restriction and shall provide the reasons for inclusion in the registry referred to in subsection 7.3. 7.2, notwithstanding subsection 7.1, the minister is not required to disclose information that is not provided, rather that is provided to the minister in confidence. Thank you. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So the purpose of this is to require that there's a written decision on the request for a designated or sorry, a restricted area. As people will recall, these are uh, temporary restrictions for up to two years. And just in the interest of accountability, it was felt uh, that uh, the minister should provide uh, written reasons one way or another as to what his decision, his or her decision would be, and that's the purpose of this amendment. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the motion. Question. Question.
question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. Thank you. The minister concurs with this amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 22 as amended. Mr. Testart. Nothing there. Clause 22 as amended. Committee agree? Okay, once again, to clause 22, committee agree? Agreed. 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 22 as amended, does committee agree? Agreed. Gets me past there. Yep, yep. Thank you, committee clause to clause 23, Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that paragraph 23, bracket 1, bracket B of Bill 34 be amended by striking out that requires and substituting that requires or holds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that paragraphs 1, 23, 1, B, brackets, of Bill 34 be amended by striking out brackets, that acquires brackets, and substituting that acquires or holds bracket. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. The motion is in order to the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 23 as amended. Mr. O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that Bill 34 be amended by adding the following after subclause 23.1.1. No employee of the department shall use confidential information obtained in the course of the employee's employment for personal benefit or the benefit of another person. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So we're dealing with a, a section of the bill that talks about uh, departmental employees and how they um, should and uh, govern themselves in terms of the uh, carrying out their duties and uh, they would come into uh, information about mineral rights and mining and so on and uh, um, what we want to do is protect our employees and make sure that they um, uh, have clear guidance in the uh, the uh, legislation as well there was no explicit prohibition on the the use of uh, information that they might obtain uh, during the course of their employment for a personal benefit or and so we wanted to clarify that uh, with this provision and uh, as I said I think this is about clarifying uh, making sure that our employees are protected uh, thanks very much mr. chair thank you mr. O'Reilly to the motion question. question has been called all those in favor all those opposed the motion is carried does the minister concur with this amendment we accept the minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 23 as amended. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I move that Bill 34 be amended in that portion of subclause 23-2, preceding paragraph A, by striking out in good faith for other than and substituting in good faith and for other than. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Question, Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 23 as amended. 
Mr. Tester. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that subclause 23.3 of Bill 34 be amended by striking out to acquire and substituting to acquire or hold. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 23 as amended. Agreed. Thank you. Clause 24. I'll go to Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. So just before we get into some motions here, I'd like to just have a really clear explanation as to the purpose of zones. That's the, the, the section of the bill that we're now on. And uh, this would allow for the establishment of uh, more favorable requirements in some areas than, than others. And I'd like someone to explain to me the clear purpose of this and uh, who are these requirements more favorable to? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Zones were intended to encourage exploration and were never intended to be used for changing royalty requirements. Uh, any changes to royalty requirements will be done through other means such as intergovernmental agreements. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So yeah, I, I did hear the minister say uh, encourage exploration. And we've had, a, I guess, a long ongoing conversation about this. Um, I, I'll be the first to say that um, the Department of Industry, Tourism and Investment does a very good job, a fabulous job at promoting resource development. That's their job. And they do a very good job at that. They have many dedicated employees. They're out there promoting mining and oil and gas and that's what they can and should be doing. But when that sort of um, perspective and uh, uh, mandate begins to influence the administration of mineral rights and that's what this bill does. And the minister said this is about encouraging exploration. Um, this is a dangerous mixing of objectives. Um, there are many conflicting uh, uh, views and objectives uh, in terms of uh, mining. And, uh, you know, mining companies want to have access to resources. Uh, they want to have capital to work with. Uh, they want to make money. At the same time, those people uh, managing mineral rights are supposed to do it in the public interest to make sure there's a, a fair return to the public purse. The environment's protected. Um, we protect our communities. We make sure that indigenous rights are respected and so on. So there's a whole bunch of conf uh, potentially conflicting, but sometimes differing objectives here. And when I hear that the, the purpose of this part of the bill is to actually encourage exploration. I think that's a very dangerous mixing of objectives. And, um, you know, if it, in an ideal world, I think that this bill should actually be, uh, mineral rights should be administered by a different department. And I, I've been on record as saying that that department should be the Department of Lands, who already administers other kinds of land rights and disposition on the surface. So they have experience doing that sort of thing. So I think there's, an inherent conflict of interest when this department starts to administer mineral rights with the objective of trying to encourage mineral exploration. And if that's what this purpose is all about, I think it's very bad public policy. And uh, should, it really has no place in, in this bill. Um, there's other ways the department encourages mineral exploration. We have a, a mining incentive program, some other great programs, but to start to mix that objective into how we administer mineral rights, I think, is very dangerous. So I'm happy to hear what the minister has to say. But uh, I think this is uh, not good governance. It's not good public policy. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Take that as a comment. To the comment, Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So with that said, zones were included in the bill to create a method for Indigenous governments to drive where and how they could attract investment within their lands if they choose. We believe IGO sponsorship of a zone is sufficient as is sufficient as the IGO would be represented the best interests of their members for that region. And zones were also intended to provide greater certainty for industry by indicating where indigenous governments would welcome greater exploration. And I also want to add to that many jurisdictions have different ways to attract investment to their, to their provinces. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you. Further, Mr. Telstar. Yeah, uh, thank you. I just um, um, hearing the minister's commentary on this section as well. Um, we received kind of feedback from industry that seemed to, their understanding of zones was an extension of uh, prospecting licenses. And this would be the way to kind of transition them. And I think the department has said something similar. Um, I don't see that from how zones work. I think the minister actually describes zones very well as a, a unique tool for IGOs to operate. I don't think they have much to do with prospecting um, licenses. Could the minister just clarify that just so we can understand clearly what these sections are? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Farina. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, so this is also the enabling authority for the current prospecting permits. Uh, that's because prospecting permits are essentially based on the zones of north and south. So because prospecting permits would be essentially the regulations that establish the zone underneath this enabling authority, you don't see expressly in the act prospecting permits. Uh, but this is also the enabling authority, so it has that dual purpose in mind. It's still a lot of its regulations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testart? So would, uh, would there be any practical changes to how prospecting licenses operate under this section of the Act? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Farina. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so you'll see in the act that it actually continues the prospecting permit regulations. These are the permit regulations. The licenses are your initial license to just um, start looking at the land with, before you stake your claim. The prospecting permits are uh, another, another pre-staking uh, tool, but they are issued and they are not the license. They are a separate regime, let's say and those ones um, are continued, those regulations are continued under the act as it comes into force. Uh, that's not to say that we can review them and make you know, improvements, but they are moved over uh, pretty much in the same form under this enabling authority. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, anything further, Mr. Testart? Yeah, just one more, and sorry that I misspoke. It's been a long day, um, but, I, but I am speaking to prospector permits, prospecting permits. Um, can a per prospecting permit and an IGO designated zone coexist in the same space? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Farina. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, it would depend on what those uh, prospective zone regulations say, but I suppose in the development, we would uh, anticipate that issue being dealt with. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testart? Nothing further. Clause 24, Mr. Simpson, or before I go there, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I hadn't concluded my uh, questions. Um, the minister didn't really answer my question about who these zones are uh, really favorable to, as set out in 24-2B. Uh, Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Schumann. That's right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the way I, way I read this thing, it's favorable to the IGOs and the proponents that want to work with the IGOs in, a, in the creation of a zone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, it's a little bit vague in here. Um, the minister also said that these uh, restricted, uh, or sorry, the zones could be uh, uh, set up or at the request of Indigenous governments, but of course the Minister has the ability to set these uh, zones up on his or her own initiative as uh, provided for under uh, paragraph 7 of this uh, clause. So um, what I'm concerned about is um, by allowing this uh, establishment of zones, there's going to be regions, community, Indigenous governments that are competing against each other to try to attract investment, to try to attract um, mine, mineral exploration into their jurisdiction to provide some benefits. Um, so how do we stop what could eventually develop here, uh, I believe, into a race to the bottom, where 
uh, regions, uh, communities uh, um, are competing against each other to try to capture some of the limited exploration dollars by, by having less and less restrictions in terms of, you know, maybe the work requirements uh, on, a, on a mining claim or the length of uh, a mineral claim could be extended. Um, the, you know, all kinds of things could be done. Virtually anything can be uh, varied in the creation of a zone. So what is to stop the race to the bottom from happening here? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Schumann. Well, first of all, I think that's the members, the members take on, on a race to the bottom. Um, as I've said, zones, the acts enable us to have zones. Any zones that's gonna be created, we'd have to consult with all IGOs that are applicable to the, which zone was gonna be created. And, we, and it's gonna be IGO driven. I don't see this as a race to the bottom. We've had this discussion before and I think the member and myself are at different ends of the spectrum on it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. O'Reilly? Thanks, Mr. Chair. So how will the minister make sure that there isn't a race to the bottom? Is this going to be monitored? Uh, is there going to be some kind of public reporting? Will the public have the ability to review uh, the regulations that are uh, going to be uh, brought forward for the creation of zones? Uh, how do we, what sort of checks and balances are going to be put in place? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Schumann. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As I said, uh, we'd have to consult with all the applicable IGOs anyway on this as well going forward on it, so I don't see that as, as being a problem. And there's going to have to be rig development on this, and so we're going to have to continue to work on this. But uh, as I said, I don't believe that uh, the members' views are correct, and I will stand my ground on the creation of these zones. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. O'Reilly, have others in the queue just to remind you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And I just want to turn to the, our uh, law clerk for a second. Um, somewhere in the bill, and I just can't put my fingertips on it, there are some provisions around what set of rules um, can apply in a zone. And I don't know where that crops up in the bill, whether it's under this section or not. Just... Thank you. We'll give the law clerk a moment. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Section 24 speaks to that, and then there is also the ability to set, uh, set the zones by regulation. I wonder if the member might be contemplating some motions that may be coming. Thank you. Not to offend the rule against anticipation. Thank you. Anything, nothing further, Mr. O'Reilly. Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think the, these zones, the whole issue of zones here is a good management tool or a, or a land management regime. Similar uh, occurrences happened uh, in the SATU in, in several projects by several developers coming in. So the communities or the districts established this concept of, of zones, zone one, two, and three. In, in, in the case of the Satu district, then the region, then the territory, it, it gives reference to a classification of a land in order by order by order. So uh, it, it makes it more understanding when you refer to zone A or B with the terms and conditions set out and regulations up applicable to the to the particular zone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. Clause 24. Next, I have, oh, okay, before we get there, Mr. Testart. Might we take a brief recess, Mr. Chair? I'm trying to get to where we can get through Clause 24 first, and That's then uh, I intend to call a recess. Further, uh, Mr. O'Reilly. I apologize, Mr. Chair. This has been a long day for us all. This is a complicated piece of legislation, and I'm trying to get myself organized, so my apologies. But the section I was thinking of is actually at 24.9. And so this is where it appears to me that um, someone who 
wants to apply for a prospecting license, a, a acquire a claim or a lease or so on, um, can do so under the, sp the special regulations that are set up to establish a zone, but they seem to also be able to apply in accordance with general regulations under as, as established under this act. So it seems like someone could apply to acquire mineral rights or do something within a zone under those special zone regs or the laws or the, the general application. Is that the case? Because it just seems like you could have two regimes applying within the same zone. So I just would like to get some clarity around that. I'd like to ask the department that and then I'd like to ask our law clerk. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Farina. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know that actually the intention of this is to avoid having a patchwork. So at the bottom of across the Northwest Territories, as far as it's uh, within our jurisdiction of this act, you will be able to apply under the normal rules that this act sets out. Um, I guess you can compare it to the prospecting permit system we have right now. So anyone is free to follow the, the same system that's set out in the mining regulations. They have the option if they so choose or can choose to um, use the prospecting permit system under the zones. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I understand prospecting zone, uh, permits, those are under the mining regulations as they exist now. Zones, though, provide for, almost, at the administrator's discretion, almost anything to be changed, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that, in terms of the size of claims, the work that might be required, whether it's a permit, whatever. So I guess I'd like to ask the law clerk, um, under this provision, to me it looks like there could be two sets of rules for acquiring mineral rights within a zone. And I, I just don't know how to interpret that. That's my plain language reading of this. I've heard from the departmental uh, staff that that doesn't seem to have been the intention maybe, but the way this is drafted is a problem because I think it does not create clarity. It, you could have two different regimes applying in a zone. Is that the interpretation I should take of this? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Ms. McPherson. Thank yep. you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Because we don't know what the regulations for a zone are going to be, it is difficult to have a ready example for you. But I do note that this for greater certainty clause is limited to applying for an instrument in accordance with the regulations. So what it does not do is state that there are entirely different rules that apply. It just says that if somebody is applying for an instrument being a legal interest, for example, a mineral lease, that if there are different requirements to apply for a mineral lease in a zone by virtue of special zone regulations, then the general rules that apply, regulations that apply, a proponent would have the option of using either one, the rules of general application or the special requirements that are set up under the zone. But it is a, a this clause is designed to address the application for an instrument and saying that if you want to get this instrument, you can do so under the general rules that exist in all of the Northwest Territories or the special ones that might be created in a zone. And I believe uh, we also have um, the benefit of some legislative drafting expertise here in the form of Ms. McLaughlin, but I believe that is the intention of this clause, is to allow a proponent to choose how to apply if there are different different um, regimes that are established in relation to an instrument. Thank you, Ms. McPherson. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I think this clause needs more work. <laughs> And uh, unfortunately, we're at the clause by clause stage. This is not the first time I've raised this issue. I've raised this issue when we met with the minister for six hours on a whole bunch of matters before. So we're dealt with trying to deal with it now. 
I, you know, if the intention of this is to try to create some clarity and certainty, having two sets of rules potentially apply in a zone is not good. That's not good public policy, does not create certainty. And I, th I understand what the intent may be, but that's not what I read into this, and this is a problem. So I don't know what to do about it now, Mr. Chair, but I flagged this problem and I tried to get it dealt with before. It, it has not been dealt with, and now we're faced with trying to, this is, it shouldn't be passed in this way. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, take that as a comment. Um, last comment, Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Having went through similar projects, I guess in in, in twenty four nine here for great for as it says in the first three words for great for greater certainty, I I understand the, the uh, certainty in, in, in these two uh, applicable statements within twenty four nine. So I get it. I just wouldn't mind to see the uh, regulations that might uh, emphasize more certainty. But to the principles of uh, twenty four nine. I don't have a problem with it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Take that as a comment to the comment. Ms. Farina. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't believe there's two sets of rules. I, I'm not sure what you imagine by rules, but actually, I guess there's only one set of rules. That's the groundwork that's in the, the act itself, which you must follow uh, in order to get an instrument in, in those instruments. In those zones, there's another option. Um, but it doesn't change that base layer. You can always use that base layer to get your, get your rights under this act. So um, just further to the comment that was made by the law clerk, uh, just to clarify, I'm not sure if, if everybody understood it the way I did, but the way I understand what she's saying is that um, the instruments here, the, the groundwork is the same for the instruments. Uh, there may be different ways that you can apply or meet the requirements around those instruments, but uh, this is just clarifying that your, um, the option is about get, how to get those instruments and it doesn't change the rules on those. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Ms. Farina. So, committee, before we get into the actual clauses, there's about four clauses that affect this. Uh, we've gone past the an hour and a half mark of this meeting and I'm gonna call a five minute break. But I will remind folks that uh, we are less than a quarter through the process and uh, this will be the time in which as the chair I'm going to start to put a little bit of pressure on the witnesses and our committee to be as concise uh, and as efficient as possible. Let's call a five minute break. Thank you.
All right, folks, I'd like to call us back to order. Members, if I can get you back in your seats, please. Witnesses are with us. All right, thank you everybody. We will continue with the clauses. Clause 24, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have uh, Mr. Some Chair. quite, or Mr. Chair, I have some uh, quite lengthy uh, opinions about clause 24. Mr. Chair, I move the subclause 24.2 of Bill 34 be amended by deleting that portion preceding paragraph A and substituting the following two subject to the section the Commissioner and Executive Council on the initiative of the Minister or as proposed in accordance with this section may be, may by regulation establish zones. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So I think to be fair here, uh, we did have lots of discussions with the department about this idea of zones. And at one point they said, what do you guys want? What, what, what kind of baseline do you, you think you need to uh, be able to establish these zones? So committee identified a number of things. Uh, so this would um, take the regulation making authority, not just from the minister, but the cabinet as a whole. And I support that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion carries. Does the mo uh, sorry? Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 24 is amended. Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that clause 24 of Bill 34 be amended by adding the following after subclause brackets two. 2.1, the establishment of a zone under subsection two shall not change the royalty requirements that would make, that, that would otherwise apply. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, the motion is in order to the motion. Question, Question has been called, all those in favor? All those opposed, the motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 24 as amended. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I move that uh, sub clause 24 7 of Bill 34 be deleted in the following substituted bracket 7. A zone may be established under subsection 2 and the regulations establishing the zone may set out requirements that the minister considers appropriate on the minister's own initiative or as recommended by the proposing indigenous government or organizations after A, the minister engages with the applicable indigenous governments and organizations in respect of requirements and B, a reasonable opportunity has been provided by the minister for the public to provide comments on the merits of the proposed zone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So this gets back to what I felt were a reasonable set of compromises to ensure that the public interest would be considered and receive, uh, um, or that these zones would be established in a way to ensure that the public interest was served in some measure. So what this does is provide the opportunity for the public to comment uh, on a, the merits of a z proposed zone. Uh, so there might be a regulation that's made available for a period of, of uh, comment, and then the minister can go ahead and do whatever the minister wants. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To the motion, Mr. Simpson. Thank you. I support this motion. Uh, this committee and other committees have had difficulty getting any sort of uh, public uh, engagement opportunities or comment opportunities on regulations into legislation and uh, I'm not sure why. And it, it doesn't hurt to hear other ideas, doesn't, hear to, doesn't hurt to be open-minded and so I think this is a, a, a fair compromise to allow for some public input uh, that can be completely ignored by the government if they want to. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. 
Does the minister concur with this amendment? No, we do not. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The minister does not concur with the amendment. The amendment will not take effect as a result. Committee to Clause 24 is amended. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I move that Clause 24 of Bill 34 be amended by deleting subclause 9 and substituting the following. 9. The minister shall provide written reasons for the decision to establish a zone under subsection 2 for inclusion in the registry referred to in subsection 73. 10. Notwithstanding subsection 9, the minister is not required to disclose information that is provided to the minister in confidence. 11. Any zone established under subsection 2 shall operate for a period of no longer than 15 years. 12. The zone established under subsection 2 or renewed under this subsection may be renewed A, only after an assessment of the merits of continuing the zone and B, for a period of no longer than 15 years. 13. For greater certainty, if a zone is established under this section, a person may apply for an instrument in accordance with the regulations establishing the zone or may apply in accordance with the general regulations established under this act. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So this is, sets out a number of other sort of the floor for how zones should be established. The minister would have to provide written reasons uh, subject to the confidentiality requirements as determined by basically by the minister. Uh, the zone could only be for a maximum of 15 years. And if it is to be renewed, there has to be consideration of, of the merits of continuing the zone. Um, and if it's to be continued, it can only be for a period of no longer than 15 years. So it sets a time limit on this. And then of course we come back to the infamous number 13, which establishes two sets of rules for zones. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, but I do support these. These are important, um, I guess, terms, conditions that can and should be established or put a, a, on in terms of establishing these zones in the first place. So I support them. I still don't agree with zones in general, but I'll support this motion. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To the motion. Question, Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed, the motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. Thank you. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 24 as amended. Does committee agree? agree. Clause 25 to 27, does committee agree? agree? Clause 28, committee agree? Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I move that subclause 28.5 of Bill 34 be amended, A, in that portion preceding paragraph A, by adding, or if applicable to a municipality after Indigenous government or organization, and B, uh, in paragraph A, by adding, or is within or overlaps the land of that municipality after Indigenous governments or organization. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So consistent with the way uh, that Indigenous governments um, are going to be um, provided notice of uh, the intention or application to record claims uh, in areas that they have an interest, um, what this, uh, the purpose of this motion is to allow municipal governments to receive notice of recording of claims. And uh, I think it's important that we recognize and try to avoid land use dispute, disputes from happening in the first place, as I mentioned earlier in some of my remarks. Uh, this is not about taking away from the rights of Indigenous governments in any way, uh, but this is about ensuring that municipalities receive the kind of information that they can and should be entitled to, to make sure that they can carry out areas within their jurisdiction, like land use planning and you know, business uh, licensing and so on, so that they have that kind of information uh, provided to them by our government as a result of mineral rights uh, disposition. So uh, that's what the purpose of this act is, and we should just treat our uh, municipal governments with the respect that they deserve. Thanks, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you. To the motion, Mr. Simpson. Thank you. And once again, this is just getting information out. A, a lot of these motions are just to, uh, to allow inf the flow of information either to the government or out from the government or to other governments. And, uh, you know, th there's nothing wrong with, with being more knowledgeable about uh, what's happening around you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To the motion. Question, Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? No, we do not. We believe the positive obligation to circulate notices to Indigenous governments with the territory overlapping a, the claim application area recognizes our unique and inherent rights related to the land, which is reflective of our government's commitment to honouring these rights. We see this motion as unnecessary as municipal or local governments can effectively receive notice under 28 bracket 4. All, the public, all of the public received notice under section 28 bracket 4 and municipal or local governments would be able to access the notice. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister. The Minister does not concur with the amendment. The amendment will not take effect as a result. Committee to Clause 28. Does the committee agree? Committee to move forward. Does the committee agree? Thank you, committee. Clause 29 to 33, committee agree? Thank you. Clause 34, Mr. Simpson. I move that the English version of subclause 34.2 of Bill 34 be amended by striking out or of any part or share thereof or interest therein and substituting or any. Let me start over here. I move that the English version of subclause 34.2 of Bill 34 be amended by striking out or of any part or share thereof or interest therein and substituting or of any part or share thereof or interest therein. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order. To the motion. Question. To the motion, question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed, the motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 34 as amended. Does committee agree? Let's use the right terminology, please. Co uh, committee clause 35 to 41, does committee agree? Thank you. Committee clause 42. Mr. Testar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that subclause 42 brackets 5 of Bill 34 be amended A in that portion preceding paragraph A by adding or if applicable to a municipality after Indigenous government or organization and B in paragraph A by adding or is within or overlaps with the land of that municipality after Indigenous government or organization. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, the motion is in order to the motion. Mr. Testart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is a motion to uh, require notice of intended work as uh, understood by the Act or as laid out in the Act be provided to municipalities if that work, intended work, occurs um, uh, in, within municipal boundaries or near municipal within or overlapping the land of, of a municipality. And again, this is um, a recognition that this bill is uh, uh, a bill for the public as much as it is a bill for governments. And we have, um, in, in the Northwest Territories, our local governments are the, the cornerstone of um, our communities and have uh, very important responsibilities in a vast territory that is often uh, quite separate geographically. So we wanted to uh, respect that they have a unique operating environment, they have a unique role in our communities, and they should be treated fairly in terms of notice of what's happening in their lands. So I hope committee will support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. To the motion, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So yeah, once again, uh, this is a new requirement. Uh, in the bill, the uh, note what what is intended work and what that consists of is going to be determined at the sole discretion of the minister through regulations that will be defined to ensure that there's no confidential information that's uh, provided. Um, 
So there's the ability to protect the rights and interests of a mineral uh, claim or leaseholder. Um, but what this is about is avoiding land use conflicts again and just providing some reasonable notice to uh, municipal governments to ensure that there's good working relationships and uh, it's all about sharing information and, and encouraging good working relationships. We have this actually happening on the ground here by Terra-X. They do this kind of stuff already. They tell people in the community, we're going to be out drilling, this is where we're going to go and do this. And they, they make uh, extraordinary efforts to avoid land use conflicts. This is about codifying that practice. And it's also about recognizing our municipal governments, which are creatures of the territorial government, and, and affording them the, the, the ability to get this kind of notice so that they know what's going on within their boundaries. It's about making sure we have good neighbors, avoiding land use conflicts. So I'm really disappointed that our government is not prepared to go that distance to provide the kind of recognition uh, that municipal governments have asked for and, and uh, uh, that they deserve. So I'm really very disappointed that this is something this minister, this department is stuck on. We dealt with this in the context of the Public Land Act last night in a clause by clause review where new dispositions of land notice is gonna be given to community governments for those dispositions within their boundary. This is the same concept here about mineral rights and I really hope that the minister is gonna accept this. And if not, I want to have some very good reasons and the public deserves to know why the minister will not accept this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We decline this motion. This notice of intended work provision is intended to recognize the inherent rights of Indigenous governments and ensure there is an awareness of what's happening on their lands. Municipalities do not possess the same inherent status. Moreover, industry representatives emphasize that exploration requires flexibility to adjust plans. They also express concerns about confidentiality. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The minister does not concur with the amendment. The amendment will not take effect as a result. Committee to Clause 42. Does the committee agree? Agree. Thank you. Clause 43 to 48. Does the committee agree? agree? Thank you. Clause 49, Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that 49 of Bill 34 be amended by striking out brackets, dispose of or damage a drill core brackets and substituting brackets, dispose of damage or abandon a drill core brackets. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So what this does is include the concept of abandoning drill core and uh, so that uh, no person shall, except in accordance with the regulations, abandon uh, drill core. So what we want to do with this is uh, make sure that we don't end up with large piles of drill core out there that can present a uh, public safety concern. Uh, the minister's going to have the ability to make regulations. Um, from what I can determine, there seems to be a bit of a regulatory gap here where uh, drill core storage is not governed under land use regulations. The committee may find some other ways to try to address this in its report, but I think this is an important improvement to uh, make sure that drill core can only be abandoned in accordance with whatever rules the minister wants to set out in regulations, and hopefully there's an opportunity for the public to have some engagement and involvement in that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To the motion. Question, Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed, the motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 49 as amended. Does committee agree? Thank you. To clause 50, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I move that uh, clause 50 of Bill 34 be amended by adding the following after sub clause 2, 3. The minister shall, when practicable and safe to do so, and in accordance with the regulations, make accessible to the public any drill core, cores that the minister takes possession of under subsection one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The, oh, sorry, the motion is in order to the motion. 
Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So uh, this new provision in the Mineral uh, uh, Mineral Resources Act would uh, allow for the minister to take possession of core. I guess there was a view of committee that if the minister's going to take possession of it, that there should be some public access allowed to it because that is can provide uh, good geological information uh, that should be part of our geological knowledge base. And so this just gives the minister the ability to, uh, or requires that the minister make it available when it's safe to do so. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Motion is in order to the, or to the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 50 as amended. Does committee agree? Thank you. Clause 51, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So before we get into uh, a motion I want to propose, I would like to just get a better understanding of what the intent of Section 51 is all about. Um, and I'll start with that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This measure is intended to provide the territorial government the statutory authority to negotiate benefits for residents, of Northwest Territories residents. It is also intended to provide the flexibility to use whatever tool is deemed appropriate to ensure benefits occur to Northwest Territory residents. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Can the, the minister tell me what benefits really means? Because there's no description in the bill. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That will be done in regulations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So, okay, so benefits are the determination of what a benefit is, is going to be set out in regulation. Um, it's a curious way of writing this because it, it's not even tied to any kind of mineral activity. It's not even tied to mining or mineral exploration, development. Uh, the minister may prescribe requirements in respect of measures that provide benefits. Why is there, it's not even tied to any kind of activity related to mineral exploration or development? Prospecting, uh, staking of a claim, uh, the work that has to be done to keep a claim in good standing, a lease. This would, seems to give the minister the authority to pres prescribe benefits about anything. Is that what the intention is here, Mr. Chair? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's in the scope of the statute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, great. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. So um, what would trigger uh, a benefit uh, as uh, contemplated under Section 51? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is it, is it a property going into production? Is it staking of a claim? How far back in the, 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 the mining cycle is this, are these benefits going to be required of industry? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One example is to be able to enter into a social economic agreement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So, okay, socioeconomic agreements. We've got ones with the diamond mines, one with, I think, Prairie Creek, one with NICO, which have not started commercial production. Is it conceivable then that this government is going to ask for socioeconomic agreements for um, uh, prospecting, for uh, exploration phase? Uh, when, what is going to be the trigger here? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, our intent is not to do that. Our focus has always been on the production. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Great. Thank you. So now we're getting somewhere. So the intent is to have these benefits start with production. Why does the bill not say this? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Schumann.
Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We want to be able to have the ability to uh, evolve the discussion with our other departments going forward on the benefit agreements. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. O'Reilly? Yeah, look, um, the difficulty, I think, with, I understand the concept of providing benefits for activities that might happen during the mining cycle. That's great, and of course, everybody wants that to happen. But the lack of any precision or triggers criteria in here, um, I understand that there's a lot of concerns about what could happen under the other sections of the, 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 the part five here in terms of benefits for indigenous uh, governments, but there's no precision in here. There's no, no outline of a process. This could reach right back into prospecting and the, the amount of uncertainty, uh, lack of clarity here, this is a ticking time bomb about how the government might reach back and require benefits of, of people that have prospecting licenses. I just don't understand why there wasn't some precision brought to the trigger for the, the, these benefits, um, the timing of them, uh, the, 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 the uncertainty that this creates is just tremendous. And I, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around why the, the, this is not better defined in some way with some kind of a trigger, some list of what these benefits might start to look like this creates tremendous uncertainty for industry. Uh, and I think this has a potential to scare away investment from the Northwest Territories, given the uncertainty and the, the discretion that the minister has under this section. So how can we fix this? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Schumann. I'm only gonna take his comments as noted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, comment as noted. Nothing further, next I have Mr. Testart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what, what statutory impediments exist that uh, exist to the GNWT signing SEAs with industry at this time? Thank you. Thank you. Minister Schumann. There's no statutory authority for it anywhere. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testar. Uh, sir, my question was around statutory impediments. Is there any anything preventing the government from, from entering into a socioeconomic agreement with, in, with industry? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minister Schumann. <coughs> no, there's not. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testar. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this section as written, as it currently exists in the bill, could the government apply benefit agreements to prospecting to exploration to all other sections of the bill. Could this section be used for that? Not will it, but could it? Thank you. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Um, this is a, you know, it's vague enough that we uh, could do that, but that's never been our attention. That would have to be set, we would have to set it out in regulations to determine how we're going to do it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testart? Um, perhaps. Okay, so I, I share my colleagues' concerns, right? I, you know, the, the justification we've had tonight on, on Section 51 is it's required to have a statutory authority to enter into SEAs. We've just determined that that's not required, that SEAs can be entered into and are already are. And there are three in effect in the Northwest Territories that my colleague, the Honorable Member from Frame Lake brought forward in this discussion. And then the other reason for leaving it intentionally vague was to quote, evolve the discussion. What does that mean, evolve the discussion? I don't think we have I don't think there's a ready answer for that. I think it's a placeholder for wherever the department or the government wants to go. And my concern is again, the lack of certainty in the section and the wide ranging of it. We have to trust that the regulations will accommodate the, the certainty that investment in industry is looking for. Because at the end of the day, if there is no investment, if there is no exploration, if there is no industry taking interest in the Northwest Territories, there is, there, there's no need for legislative benefits because there won't be any development. We have to be very careful about how we roll out uh, laws like this, and this section is, in, is intentionally vague to the point of absurdity. There is no triggers, there's no clarity, and as we've learned tonight, there's no, there's no real need for this other than to, quote, evolve the discussion. 
And I think industry and indigenous governments and indigenous nations have been involving the discussion on their own very well in the uh, recent history of the Northwest Territories and have established a precedent um, that exists in certain signed claims and that is uh, a real requirement for social license, which is an important concept for any kind of natural resource development in Canada in particular. If you don't have social license, you will not be able to raise capital for your project. That's just the way it works now. We are trying to legislate something that is taking care of itself and not pr providing the criteria that, um, that gives any comfort to industry or investment. And this is a huge, huge concern of mine. Thank you. Thank you. Take that as a comment. Any reply to the comment? Comment is noted. Next, I have Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Over the years, the one thing that I've heard, and I'm sure most residents of the territory have heard, uh, is that they're upset about uh, the agreements in place, that there's, there's nothing uh, more enforceable. Uh, and I, when, when I first read this act, I thought that that hadn't been addressed. And, and the more I looked at it, the more I realized that uh, it is, uh, th this, this clause basically gives the government carte blanche to uh, require benefits from anyone doing, or any entity doing any work within the scope of this bill. Uh, it's the ultimate power. And for somehow, it, it just sort of, it took me a while to realize and it kind of slipped by. And the, the lack of clarity is, it, it is staggering. And as public representatives, we have to ensure that there is not this lack of clarity that leads to unfettered, unfettered power. Um, we, can't leave, um, we can't leave things up to the, the benevolence of ministers and bureaucrats. Uh, you know, that, that's a whole, the whole role we have here. We're here to represent the public and uh, you know, this is just, uh, this is government overreach if, if I've ever seen it. And this is going to uh, scare away any exploration, any investors, uh, once it comes to light what actually this, uh, this provides, the kind of power that this provides the government. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Take that as a comment to the comment. Comment noted. Further, Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Ch Chair. I'll just provide some comments on, on an experience that I had minimal with the, uh, the, the one company doing some exploration in, in, in our area. West of Norman Wells, they're within a claimed area. And although the uh, local claimant corporations have certain powers, the project went ahead with notification, public uh, consultation, and uh, acquired the necessary land use permits to proceed on with the scope of work and the scope of work was completed a couple of weeks ago. And um, everybody walked away in support of the project, even though some vendors never got what they wanted. So I, I just share that. So to me, it, it came out with a balance. Encourage the exploration project to move ahead in hopes that it would find something that would be commercially viable and move, moving on to the next phase. So the accommodation of, of accommodation of flexibility was there and, and uh, that's underneath the old old legislation. The new one I don't have a problem with. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McNeely. To the comment. I think to the comment, comment as noted. Clause 51, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So I move that Bill 34 be amended by deleting Clause 51 and substituting the following. 51 brackets 1. The Commissioner, on the recommendation of the Minister, may prescribe requirements in respect of measures that provide benefits to the people of the Northwest Territories that the holder of a mineral lease must meet before being granted a production license. Two, benefits in the measures referred to in subsection one may include, but are not limited to, particulars in respect of the following. A, employment practices. B, human resources development. C, business development. <coughs> D, social well-being. F, monitoring and reporting. G, engagement between the parties. H, dispute resolution, I, 
any other matter that the minister considers in the public interest. Three, the minister may change the benefits required. One moment, of a member. I'm going to get you to actually go back to the point. If you can just, for the sake of the record, please start at number two again. Thanks, Mr. Chair. That's two. why we have four people here observing uh, what's being read. So kindly please start at number two again. I know it's getting late. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, two, benefits in the measures referred to in subsection one may include, but are not limited to, particulars in respect of the following. A, employment practices. B, human resources development. C, business development. D, social well-being, E, cultural well-being, F, monitoring and reporting, G, engagement between the parties, H, dispute resolution, I, any other matter that the minister considers in the public interest. Three, the minister may change the benefits required of a holder of a production license if there is a material change as prescribed in the project authorized by the production license. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, the motion is in order. To the motion, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So I did a lot of thinking about this. <laughs> and um, what this is about is codifying existing practice. We already have socioeconomic agreements for a number of uh, uh, projects. Uh, the operating diamond mines, Prairie Creek, NICO, um, and they've generally been tied with the idea of a project going into commercial production. And that's the trigger the minister identified. That's the trigger that the minister said should, where section 51 should kick in. The problem is the way it's drafted, there is no trigger. So now we've got a trigger. Subclause two here says that, uh, and of course, this trigger is at the discretion of the minister. The whole idea of benefits are at the discretion of the minister. So the second part though lays out what those benefits might start to look like. This is not a, a list that, that we dreamed up. This is, a, this is the table of contents of the NICO socioeconomic agreement. These are the categories of benefits that are generally part of socioeconomic agreements in the first place. So there's no surprises. It's a non-inclusive list. The minister may include these things. The minister doesn't have to, but it starts to lay out some expectations of what's likely to be discussed in terms of benefits. And whether that's a form of a socioeconomic agreement or benefits that are required by regulation, that's okay. But that's where this list came from. So, and then three is really about if there's a big change in the project and if those changes fit within the parameters that are set by regulation, it may allow the minister to go in and discuss how to change the benefit arrangement in some way. So this process here parallels what's already in the bill basically for indigenous governments. So it just provides some clarity, some certainty around when did this is triggered what those benefits might start to look like, and if there's a big change, there's the opportunity to reopen that, those benefits and discuss how they might be adjusted in some way. This starts to provide some certainty and clarity about what these benefits are and when they get triggered. Right now, it's completely wide open, minister's discretion, and that is gonna scare away investment. This codifies existing practice, it provides a framework that already exists for the benefit agreements with indigenous governments. Um, and I hope that the minister will accept this. This is, I think, a very reasonable approach to this. I've been thinking a lot about this. This will start to provide some clarity and certainty around these benefits that are gonna, could potentially be required at any stage of mineral exploration development. So I hope that the minister will accept this. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Next, I have Mr. Testart. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to um, thank the member for bringing this, this forward. Um, as I said in my commentary around the section as it exists in the bill, it's incredibly problematic. This is a, a, a better proposal because there are some concrete steps in there. I'm, I'm somewhat torn on it um, because um, I would not want to see a production license getting unduly um, impacted by delays if there was some sort of dispute and um, 
there is a dispute mechanism within within the act, and, and uh, it's unclear if it could apply to these. But um, I think we can work on that as well. Um, but I think this does much better. And if you look at many of the agreements, including the, the Nunavut uh, final agreement, uh, they too have an enumerated list of things that could be in a benefit agreement, and uh, you know any other thing. The, the same thing as. Uh, uh, sub two sub I in this um, motion. So I think this does a better job. It's not perfect, but uh, it's, a, it's a huge improvement over what's currently in the bill. Thank you. Thank you to the, uh, to the motion, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, and I appreciate the Sorry. department swinging for the fence with uh, the, the original clause, but I think this, uh, this is still quite broad. It still gives quite uh, expansive powers, but it gives certainty as well. And uh, I think that, you know, th that's exactly what's needed in this situation. It's not perfect, but it's, uh, it's a vast improvement over what we have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. The motion is in order to the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We cannot accept this motion. This measure is intended to provide the territorial government the statutory authority to negotiate benefits for Northwest Territories residents. It is also intended to provide the flexibility to use whatever tool is deemed appropriate to ensure benefits occur to Northwest Territory residents. This motion as presented could possibly limit the government's ability to explore new and different approaches to occurring benefits to the Northwest Territories. We do not believe it is a good idea to limit the ways by which the territorial government can no negotiate benefits in the interest of the Northwest Territories residents, and we believe there are ample authorities throughout the legislation to contend with issues like material change. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister. The Minister does not concur with the amendment. The amendment will not take effect as a result. Committee 2, Clause 51. Nay. Committee does not agree. Thank you. Committee has nayed. Minister, do you concur with the deletion? I'd like Thank to raise a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Testart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Rule 75-2 that states all amendments made in standing or special committees must have the concurrence of the sponsor of the bill uh, is invalid as this clause was not amended, but instead negative by way of a division. Uh, the House of Commons practice is clear on this point in that a bill cannot be amended if the amendment would negative the main motion. As this motion is, a, is uh, as this clause is a section of the main motion, it is tantamount to negative, negativing the main motion. This, thus drawing a clear distinction between a motion to amend, otherwise called an amendment as contemplated in Rule 75.2, and negativing a clause through a division. Rule 75.2 only deals with the concept of amendment and therefore cannot be applied in this case. Reflecting on past practices of our Legislative Assembly, clauses have typically been negative by amendment. A recent rules change was to bring our practice more in line with the House of Commons and therefore Rule 75-2 no longer applies in the way it did when amendments were considered to negative clauses and bills. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I would ask that the Minister not be allowed to, um, uh, would not be asked for concurrence on this, this negative. Thank you. Thank you. One moment. Yeah, uh, 
everybody committee, this might take a couple minutes, so I'm gonna ask that we take a quick recess and make sure that we're getting things right, and then we'll uh, call back. Right. Thank you, everybody. Point of order was raised regarding ministerial concurrence. Committee Rule 75-2 of the Rules of the Legislative Assembly states that all amendments made in a steering, uh, sorry, in a standing or special committee must have the concurrence of the sponsor of the bill. Typically in our committee clause by clause reviews, an amendment is made by way of a motion that proposes to insert or remove words or to add new clauses or schedules to a bill. In this case, committee is not moving a motion to amend or change a clause of the bill. They are simply not supporting a clause that is currently in the bill. However, to remove the clause would substantively change the bill. In keeping with the spirit and intent of consensus government and our rules and process conventions, as chair, I sought concurrence from the minister sponsoring the bill. The minister did not concur with the removal of this clause and as such, it will remain in the bill that it, sorry, that is reported to the house for further consideration. It would be highly unusual for a minority of the house to make substantive changes to a bill without the support of the sponsor of that bill. When this bill is further considered in the House, the majority of members of this assembly will have the opportunity to decide the question. I find that there is no point of order. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to appeal your ruling to the Honourable Speaker. Again, we will call a recess. I'll ask committee to come back to the table and we'll call to order. Thank you, Mr. Testark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to um, retract my appeal to the Honorable Speaker, um, although I disagreed with um, the, the rationale you provided in your ruling, I do think the outcome is sound. So I will put my thoughts in writing and provide them to either the Speaker or the Rules Committee for further clarification to our rules. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Testart. Appreciate the retraction. Folks, we can go back to the um, Clause 51. Where was I on Clause 51? Clause 51, does committee agree? Oh, all right. Oh, sorry, now I'm back to the minister's concurrence.
Nope. All right. To clause 51, committee nay. Does the minister concur? No, we do not. The minister does not concur, and therefore, clause 51 will remain in the bill. Clause 52. Committee agree? Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So, um, yeah, okay, I'll do it. I'd like to ask the minister where there's a definition for production project found in the uh, bill. It's a term that would, uh, where the uh, benefit agreement for Indigenous governments would actually be triggered. So where can I find a definition of production project? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Where is he? Um, no, there is not. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So what is the, the actual intention then uh, of uh, Section 52? What triggers the, um, I guess, discretionary requirement for a, uh, a benefit uh, uh, agreement? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I'd like to take a moment to discuss Part 5 of the Mineral Resource Act, which refers to the new requirement for the benefit agreements in the proposed legislation. We have heard from Indigenous governments and organizations that co codify our territory's longstanding commitment to bringing benefits to Indigenous peoples in Part 5 is of great importance to them. Companies here have done a great job working with Indigenous communities to realize these kinds of benefits in recent decades leading across the country, in fact. And we want to set the baseline for the future. The Department of Industry, Tourism and Investment has been clear that Bill 34 is an enabling act. While the, process and, while the process and procedures for the regulation development will be set by the 19th Legislative Assembly, we are committed to moving forward in the spirit of partnership with Indigenous governments, industry and other stakeholders as we develop regulations should this bill pass. The department has been clear that the Mineral Resource Act will not come into force until appropriate regulations have been developed and their level of comfort has been achieved with stakeholders prior to the implementation of the act. We will get it right. We recognize the need for a balance and also the need to attract and maintain investment in the mineral sector. Nevertheless, and considering the feedback received, I believe there is a value in clarifying the department's intention around part five as outlined in the proposed bill. And I'd like to walk you through some of them now and set the record straight. One, Mr. Chair, I'd first like to address the perception that this provision will deter investment. When we speak with major investors, we hear a growing trend towards socially conscious investing. Increasingly, whether projects have buy-in from and provide benefits to Indigenous peoples and their governments is a major consideration and we believe enshrining this requirement can enhance investment by preparing the Northwest Territories to lead in the sustainable investment moment. movement. Two, second, I wish to address concern that the legislate, legislating benefit agreements could deter small-scale mining operations at the grassroots level from investing in the territory. The Act outlines that benefit agreement requirement will only be triggered for those projects that meet prescribed threshold. The intent is that only significant major mining projects would meet this threshold. The exact way it is to determine will be defined in the regulations. Third, such major mining projects will be required to enter into the agreements with Indigenous governments and organizations that the Minister considers appropriate for the specific project. The Minister will provide the proponent a list of these Indigenous governments and organizations this means that if the minister identifies two indigenous governments which should benefit from a project, the major mining proponent will be required to conclude agreement with each of them. Whether there is a priority among various indigenous governments and organizations in the distribution of benefits is a matter to be determined in the negotiations between the indigenous governments and the organizations and the proponent. Because priority concerns the substance or content of 
of a benefit agreement, this is not a matter which the GNWT would be involved. Four, the fourth requirement of the benefit agreement also does not mean the parties need two agreements. Duplication is not the intent here. An existing impact benefit agreement, participation agreement, or any other agreement whereby benefits are provided to the Indigenous government and its members would suffice. It is intended that the regulations will only require a proponent to show that an agreement has been concluded which provides fair and proportional benefits in the context of the project. Five, fifth, with regards to timing, the intent is for the requirement to be flexible to allow major mining proponents to enter into these agreements at any time as long as it's prior to commencing production from a mine or the operation phase of a mine. The benefit agreement requirement is not intended to affect or to be connected to external regulatory process for a mining project, such as those that run through the territory's regional land and water boards. Six, six, we have also concerns about perceived risk and uncertainty relating to the requirement for major mining proponents to negotiate satisfactory benefit agreements before entering into production and the impact this might have on the potential investor. Bill 34 has built in three components that address such risks. The first component could be used where neither the proponent nor the Indigenous government or organization wish to enter into a benefit agreement for a proposed project. In this case, the two parties may approach the minister and request that the requirement be waived. This could be done as long as both parties are in agreement. Second component is the creation of a dispute resolution mechanism. If a proponent and an Indigenous government or an organization does not wish to waive the requirement for a benefit agreement and have done everything in their power to negotiate an agreement, they may request that the dispute resolution body resolve the issue. The dispute resolution body hears negotiation related issues and not benefit agreement implementation disputes. Parties can enforce implementation through contract law. The regulations will ensure that dispute resolution is only used if negotiations break down significantly. The third component is a ministerial waiver power. This power is not expected to be exercised often only in exceptional circumstances. The vast majority of issues will fall under the dispute resolution body jurisdiction. Cabinet must also support any proposed waiver. Mr. Chair, in closing, the Department has heard the concerns about the need for clarity around Part 5. In recognition of these concerns, I am prepared to bring forward two motions during Committee of the Whole review of Bill 34 that will, will amend this part. I believe these will add greater clarity around the requirement for benefit agreements, and I hope that this will provide some confidence to members about the Department's intentions. Once again, I look forward to continuing to work with our partners in the Indigenous governments, industry, and our other stakeholders to provide further details around this section and others in the bill during regulation development. As we develop our execution plan with the milestones and timelines, we will work closely with our key stakeholders while leaving room for our future government to define and implement a consistent process moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister. To that, Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, I appreciate the uh, explanation. That's not really what I had asked, but uh, it certainly opens up a whole bunch of other issues and concerns. Uh, I know how long we've been here already, but uh, um, maybe I would like to know whether the minister is prepared to share the motions that the department has drafted with all regular MLA so that we don't end up in the f on the floor of the house being surprised. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Seeking a minister commitment to share those motions with PNP, essentially. Minister Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We shared those motions with Sketty yesterday. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All members. Oh.
for clarification. The, the question is, will you share it with all regular members? And we want to be sure that it's the final version of the motions that you have prepared. Thank you. Minister Schumann. Yes, we do agree. We can share with all members. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that commitment, and I'm sure the minister will do his best to get those amendments to all regular MLAs well in advance of when uh, the bill is considered in committee of the whole. I'd like to know as well, is it the intention of the minister to consult with the Indigenous governments and organizations uh, with regard to these amendments that he intends to bring forward? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We will uh, consult with the ICGS on these motions as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, <coughs> I do want a chance to quickly address some of the items that the minister uh, um, mentioned in his response or lengthy remarks. Um, why we're here is because of the, the uncertainty that's been created with the drafting of this bill. That's why we're here at this point. Um, it's been poorly drafted, uh, sorry, with all due respect, I do not fault any of the, the people that were involved in actually putting together the legal language for this. Clearly this is not constructed in a way that many people can understand this. And uh, certainly regular MLAs don't seem to be able to understand this. Industry doesn't seem to be able to understand this. You got a problem. So, um, but for the record, I do support, and the minister knows this because I've told him and I've said it in public, I support the requirement for a benefit agreement to be negotiated with Indigenous governments before a major mining project goes into production. And in fact, several of the land rights agreements actually contain provisions that require at least the beginning of the negotiation. This may even require or could require, depending on how the minister does the regulations, the conclusion of such an agreement. So I support that. The problem is the way it's been drafted, it creates tremendous uncertainty. And you're hearing that right now. You're hearing it from the regular MLAs. You're hearing it from folks in industry. So you've got a problem. We've tried to work with you to make some suggestions about improving that, and I just don't get a sense that we're actually making much progress. So. I will have uh, some amendments to move, Mr. Chair, to try to provide some clarity. Um, there's no definition of production project in the bill, no clear tie to when this would actually kick in. There are concerns that have been expressed to us about what exceptional circumstances the minister might use to uh, use a waiver. I don't think we've tried to deal with that, but there's tremendous uncertainty in this, the way that the, the department, the minister has crafted the bill and that's just not good. Uh, if we're here to try to uh, create some certainty and clarity, this bill doesn't do it. So that's all my comments on, on this for now, but the minister knows that I clearly support the concept of having completed agreements before a project goes into uh, commercial production. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, take it as a comment, comment noted. Next I have Mr. Testart. Oh, there, that's, I'm hitting mute, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the minister provided us with a lengthy speech and I, I won't take a, a huge amount of time, but look, this is my concern. You, that speech isn't, the, the, the exact parameters of what the minister spoke of aren't in this bill. And it's fine to give a speech in this house or in this committee or in public or at Roundup, but when it comes down to it, people look at this legislation to figure out how it works, and they'll look at the com coming regulations, which will take at least five years to draft. And that's the problem here. And, and yes, committee has seen these, the, the motions that the minister plans to move, and um, I won't speak to the content of them, but I will say I don't think they go far enough. Um, we, have, we are rushing to the finish line with all of the devolution uh, uh, bills. Um, this committee raised concerns around that. 
has continued to raise concerns around that, and in the context of the MRA, there's one section that is problematic. The rest of the bill is fine. And I do not understand why, and we are moving largely fine. I see my colleagues smirking, but um, you know, th th we have a plenty of concurrent amendments here that we are working to improve the bill. This section is problematic, and I don't understand why, in, again, in a consensus government, we can't agree that this, this part needs to be parked to the 19th Assembly for further consideration. You know, that we, we've, we've undertaken a, a co-drafting or, or uh, indigenous in, involvement in drafting legislation before, and sometimes it's taken upwards of 10 years. So again, I don't understand why we need to rush so quickly, and um, I don't think the minister's given me much comfort by just laying it out, because his speech is, again, not the text of the act, and, um, and, and the actual text of the act still leaves things far too uncertain. And the whole point of this exercise is to create certainty for mineral, mineral tenure in the Northwest Territories and certainty for a regular, regulatory system. That's what I heard from industry, that they want that level of certainty. And this doesn't do it. Thank you. Thank you. If there's nothing further, Clause 52, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chu. Uh, Mr. Chair, I uh, move that paragraph 52.1a of the bill be deleted and the following substituted. If a production license issued to the holder includes a condition that requires the holder to enter into such an agreement and. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To the motion, the mo or sorry, the motion is in order. To the motion, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So the problem that I was trying to get at that initiated this whole conversation was the lack of a definition of production project and how uncertain that is. So the, the intent of this motion is to insert the word production license instead of production project. Production project has no definition in the, in the bill. Uh, it's not clear what it means. Uh, production license has a clear meaning uh, and would serve as a trigger for these sort of discretionary benefit agreements. Uh, but I think it would create greater certainty as to and set uh, what the expectations are for when this would come into play. Of course, it's all subject to regulations that the minister can do whatever he wants with, but this is about trying to create a little bit more certainty in this section, so I hope that the minister would accept it. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To the motion. Question, Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? All right, the vote is tied pursuant to rule 66.3 of rules of the Legislative Assembly. As chair of the standing committee, I will cast the deciding vote and may state the reasons for my vote. Unlike members who cast votes according to their own views, I will vote in a manner which maintains the confidence of committee in my role as an impartial chair. The general principle applied to these situations is that the chair votes to maintain the status quo in this case, that means voting to leave the bill in its existing form rather than causing it to be amended. This leaves open the opportunity for further debate at Committee of the Whole. As a result, I vote against the motion and the motion is defeated. The motion is defeated. Do not require minister concurrence. Committee to clause 52, does the committee agree? Committee Clause 53, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I move that Clause 53 of Bill 34 be amended by striking out production project and substituting project authorized by a production license. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order. To the motion, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So the current uh, Clause 53 deals with when there's a material change in a pro in a production project. Production project is not defined anywhere. We, we had that discussion. So this is try, trying to again bring a little bit more clarity to this section that ties it to something that is defined in the bill and is clearly understood. Uh, so rather than a production project, let's change it to a production license. Uh, so that is clear for everybody. And of course, this is all subject to whatever regulations the minister may bring forward. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? 
All those opposed? The motion is defeated. To clause 53, does committee agree? To clause 53, does committee agree? Nay. Committee does not agree. Committee, clause, fi sorry, uh, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, I just have a question about 53. Um, if there's a material change in production, a, an agreement subject to section 52 shall be amended. Um, is the production halted until the agreement is amended? I'm, I'm unclear and this is one of the, the, another one of the unclear points on here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Ms. Farina. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we were informed by our stakeholders and uh, those who were collaborating with of different nature that material change is a very important and sensitive topic and therefore that um, it was necessary that we refer to it in the bill level so that we were able to address it uh, when we were developing these regulations. So uh, we were not able to omit it from the bill because uh, we could not ignore it. So material changes in the bill so that we have the ability to address this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I don't mind that it's in the bill. Um, I want to know, my, I guess my question was, it's too sensitive for us to deal with the details was so it's being pushed off to the regs, but is, is it expected that if there's a material change, production will be halted? Or if there's a material change, production will go on? and the agreement will be dealt with in the meantime. That's, and this is the crux of the problem here, is that we look at this, we don't know what it means. And I just want to say, I, we deal with a lot of departments. When we, when we have the, the mining staff in front of us, I can say that it's, that team is one of the, uh, one of the best teams uh, I, I've seen. And there's a lot of good people in the, in the senior ranks of the GNWT. And so I don't want to disparage them. I think that it does a disservice to them that this uh, legislation was rushed through and then now they're, they're having to wear it because I think they're better than that. And I wish that, uh, you know, the, enough time was allotted to this so that we had uh, the act that I know that uh, they could produce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, there was a question, can, uh, I believe. Can you repeat the question? You know what, I, uh, I rescind my question and we can just continue on, thank you. Okay. All right, further, Same. committee, cl committee? Clause 54 to 59, does committee agree? Thank you. Committee to Clause 60, Mr. Testart. Apologies, Mr. Chair. Um, I move that subclause 60 brackets 4 of Bill 34 be deleted and the following substituted for the Minister shall authorize the disclosure of information contained in the statistical return submitted under the section where 15 years have passed since the date of the, at return was filed unless the disclosure of that information could reasonably be expected to prejudice the commercial interest of the operator or the holder of the applicable mineral lease of or a third party or earlier than 15 years since the date that the return was filed if A, the holder of the applicable mineral lease and the operator consent in writing to the release of information, B, the holder of the applicable mineral lease or the operator has released to the public the information contained in the return, C, the mineral lease is expired or is cancelled, or the mine to which the statistical return relates is abandoned or closed, or D, the regulations authorize the disclosure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Testart. The motion is in order to the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? Yes, we do. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 60 as amended. Does committee agree? Thank you. To clause 61, does committee agree? To clause 62, Mr. Simpson. Mr. Chair, I move that subclause 621 of Bill 34 be amended by striking out a member of the Mining Rights Panel and substituting the Mineral Rights Review Board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. We had concerns raised to us by the uh, mining industry that uh, it might not be a good idea to have a single person determine 
um, or uh, adjudicate on a dispute. And uh, so the purpose of this is to actually uh, indicate that it's not going to be a sole person that hears the uh, dispute, that there would be a, a group, uh, that the actual board itself would hear the, the dispute. So I think this is a good amendment and would ensure that there's a more, or the, the opportunity for a more reasoned discussion debate amongst the, the board members and, uh, and a better decision at the end of the day. So I support this motion and want to thank the mining industry for bringing it forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. To the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. Thank you. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 62 as amended. Does committee agree? Thank you. Clause 63. Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that 63 of Bill 34 be amended A in subclause brackets one by striking out brackets one member of the mining rights panel brackets and substituting brackets three members of the right mineral rights rights review board brackets and B in in that portion of subclause two preceding paragraph A by striking out member assigned and substituting members assigned. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 63 is amended. Mr. O'Reilly. Merci, Monsieur le Président. That the French version of paragraph 63-2A of Bill 34 be amended by adding lorsque leur présence est nécessaire à la révision after sous serment. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Question, Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with this amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 63 is amended. Does committee agree? Great. Thank you. Clause 64, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move that clause 64 of Bill 34 be amended by striking out mining rights panel and substituting mining rights review board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Sorry. Mr. O'Reilly, can you please read that again? Thanks, Mr. Chair. I move that Clause 64 of Bill 34 be amended by striking out Mining Rights Panel and substituting Mining Rights Review Board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, my God. <laughs> One moment. One moment. Maybe if, one more okay, time. If I flunk this one, can I get out of here? Uh, that Clause 64 of Bill 34 be amended by striking out Mining Rights Panel and substituting Mineral Rights Review Board. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. There Chair. We go, there we go. The motion is in order to the motion. Question. <laughs> Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with this amendment. Thank you, Minister. Committee to Clause 64 as amended. Does committee agree? Thank you. Clause 65, uh, Mr. Testar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that Clause 65 of Bill 34 be amended by striking out made by a member of the Mining Rights Panel and substituting made by the Mineral Rights Review Board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Qu question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed, the motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 65 is amended. Mr. Simpson. Thank you, uh, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Mr. Chair, I move that the English version of clause 65 <coughs> of bill 34 be amended by striking out judicial review and substituting 
judicial review. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order. To the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 65 as amended. Does committee agree? Agreed. Thank you. Clause 66, Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that clause 66 of Bill 34 be amended by striking out brackets mining rights panel and substituting brackets mineral rights review board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. Minister concurs with this amendment. Thank you, Minister. Committee to Clause 66 as amended. Does committee agree? Agreed. Thank you. Clauses 67 to 69, committee agree? Agreed. Clause 70 to 75, does committee agree? Agreed. Clause 76 to 80, does committee agree? Agreed. Clause 80 and 81, does committee agree? Agreed. Clause 82, Mr. O'Reilly. Merci, Monsieur le Président. That the French version of Clause 82 of Bill 34 be amended in that portion preceding paragraph A by striking out deux ans and substituting trois ans. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Question. Question, question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, Minister. Committee to Clause 82 as amended. Does committee agree? Thank you. Clause 83 to 89. Committee agree? Clauses 90 to 92. Committee agree? Clause 93. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Chair. I move that Clause 93 of Bill 34 be amended by A, deleting subparagraphs 1A1 and 2, and substituting the following one for a first offense to a fine not exceeding $50,000 or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding one year or to both, and two for each subsequent offense to a fine not exceeding $100,000 or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding one year or to both, and B, deleting subparagraphs 2A one and two and substituting the following one for a first offense to a fine not exceeding one hundred thousand dollars or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding one year or to both and two for each subsequent offense to a fine not exceeding two hundred thousand dollars or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding one year or to both and c deleting subparagraphs three a one and two and substituting the following one for a first offense to a fine not exceeding one hundred thousand dollars or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding one year or two both, and two for each subsequent offense to a fine not exceeding $200,000 or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding one year or two both. And thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, good one, Mr. Simpson. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So as the bill was originally put together, there was no um, uh, provision for imprisonment as a, uh, uh, a penalty. And uh, given that uh, we want to provide a, an appropriate deterrent for serious uh, matters that violations, say somebody falsifying a, uh, a uh, royalty return or something in, in that neighborhood, we felt it was appropriate to have imprisonment in here. It also matches uh, the kinds of provisions that we've seen in terms of penalties and enforcement in all the other bills that we've dealt with as a committee. So I'm not sure why it wasn't in here in the first place, but this is a committee working to provide some consistency, and uh, that's why we brought this forward. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Does the minister, uh, sorry, the motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. Thank you, the minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. <coughs> committee to clause 93 as amended. Does committee agree? Agreed. Committee 
Clauses 94 to 99, committee agree? Agreed. Clauses 100 to 103, committee agree? Clause 104, Mr. Testar. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Il est proposé que la version française du paragraphe 104.5 du projet de, de loi 34 soit modifiée par suppression de, de 10 jours. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed, the motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with this amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 104 as amended. Does committee agree? Agreed. Thank you. Clause 105, does committee agree? Agreed. Thank you. Clause 106, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that clause 106 of Bill 34 be renumbered as subclause 1061 and the following be added after that renumbered subclause 2. The minister may, in the minister's discretion, prohibit the issuance of an authorization to a an individual who held the position of officer or director of a corporation at a time when that corporation committed an offense under this act or the regulations for which that corporation was convicted or b a corporation that has an individual as an officer or director who held the position of officer or director of another corporation at a time when that other corporation committed an offense under this act or the regulations for which that corporation was convicted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So a committee had the issue of a bad actor a provision or a, a, that area of interest brought to uh, us during the review of the bill. And the theory is that if somebody's done something bad, then they be should become ineligible or uh, to uh, receive benefits or get rights under the uh, same uh, uh, legislative regime again. So that's the, 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 the theory of this. And uh, um, what we did was clarify uh, the provision in uh, B here so that uh, if a corporation or any, any board, uh, member of the uh, board of directors or an officer in that corporation has had a previous uh, conviction, um, f under the act that the minister has the discretion to uh, prohibit the issuance of an authorization to that corporation itself. So there's some incentive to better behavior. Now, I do want to point out that uh, Montana has much tougher bad actor uh, provisions in its legislation than what this is uh, appears here. In Montana, there's a prohibition on bad actors actually being eligible or to get rights in the first place. And that's what we should have been doing. So this is not the best practice. This is not what I think we should be aspiring to, but I do support this uh, motion to clarify um, who uh, is a bad actor and that it might apply to an entire corporation if someone on their board or an officer has done bad stuff before. So this is not near tough as it should be, but I can, I'll live with this for now. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. Thank you. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 106 as amended. Does committee agree? Thank you. Clauses 107 and 110. Does committee agree? Thank you. Clause 111. Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that subclause 111, brackets 1, of Bill 34 be amended A in subparagraph C1 by striking out brackets information required to be recorded in the registry brackets and substituting brackets any information required to be maintained in the registry under subsection 7 brackets one and information required to be publicly accessible under subsection seven brackets three and b in paragraph t by one striking out brackets and at the end of the english version of subparagraph two 
Two, striking out the semicolon at the end of the subparagraph three and substituting brackets and brackets and three, adding the following after subparagraph three. Four, public accessible access to drill cores in the possession of the minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order. To the motion, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So what this does is amend the regula regulation making authority of the uh, minister, I believe it is, to <coughs> provide that uh, he can make regulations around the public portion of uh, the registry that's going to be established and also with regard to public access to drill core. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is uh, sorry. The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause eleven as amended. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I move that paragraph one eleven brackets one Roman numeral one of Bill thirty four be amended by adding and respecting the authority for interim prohibitions under subsection 22, 3.1 after such a designation. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. This just gives the minister the authority to make regulations around the uh, decision to uh, make an interim restricted area, more or less, and uh, prohibit certain activities. So. It's consistent with changes we've already made to the bill. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. To the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with the amendment. Thank you, Minister. Committee to Clause 111 as amended. Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I move that Clause 111 of Bill 34 be amended A by deleting paragraph 1J and B by adding the following after subclause 2. 2.1. The Commissioner and Executive Council may make regulations respecting the establishment of zones under Section 24, including A, the process for requesting the establishment of a zone, B, prescribing an established zone and the requirements applicable to that zone, C, establishing a permitting structure for a zone, D, the process for renewing or terminating the designation of a zone and E, the transition of any claims staked and recorded in respect of an established or terminated zone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. The motion is in order to the motion, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So this gets back to the discussion that we had earlier about zones and moves the regulation making authority from the minister alone to cabinet. And uh, I guess the view of committee was that uh, decisions as significant as creating a, a different regulatory regime in a particular part of the Northwest Territories with respect to mining rights should be a decision that's made by cabinet as uh, that would allow other cabinet ministers with different kinds of interests, backgrounds, perspectives, mandates to weigh in and determine whether a zone is an appropriate thing to uh, happen or not. So that's what the purpose of this uh, motion is. Thanks, Mr. Chair, thank and I you. do support it. Uh, thank you, Mr. O'Reilly, to the motion. Question. question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The, uh, sorry, the motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with this amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to clause 111 as amended. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I move that Bill 34 be amended by adding the, f the following under subclause 111, brackets 4. 4.1. The Minister may establish one or more agreements with Indigenous governments or organizations in the Northwest Territories as to how the Commissioner and Executive Council will engage with those parties in exercising the regulation making powers under this section. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. This may look familiar to anybody who's followed us very closely. This is the same sort of uh, amendment that was attempted on the protected areas bill, 
And what this would do is simply uh, authorize the minister to enter into agreements with indigenous governments to uh, look at how uh, regulations would be developed collaboratively in, in the future. So this does not require that that happens. This is enabling. And uh, I would really like to have a clear explanation as to the minister whether he's going to concur with this or not, because it's enabling, does not require, and would uh, enable him to do the things that he's already seems to have committed to do as part of this uh, uh, clause by clause review. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. To the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We cannot accept this motion. This, this is a government-wide concern which requires broader political decision, discussion. A process for developing regulations has not yet been identified and needs to be consistent across government. This specific bill is not in place to have that discussion on an ad hoc basis. It would bring our legislation out of line with our existing legislation. Including this in the act would affect future government's ability to define and implement a consistent process moving forward. Furthermore, the devolution agreement already contains a requirement to engage with Indigenous governments on issues of land and natural resource legislation. The absence of any explicit reference to engaging or collaborating with Indigenous governments or organizations in the development of regulations should not be taken as a lack of commitment by the Government of Northwest Territories to meet its obligations to consult with IGOs and its commitment to collaborating with Indigenous governments and organizations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister. The Minister does not concur with the amendment. The amendment will not take effect as a result. Committee to Clause 111 as amended. Does the Committee agree? Mr. Testart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that Bill 34 be amended by adding the following after subclause uh, 111 4.1. 4.2, a copy of each regulation that the Commission and Executive Council proposes to make under this Act shall be published in the Northwest Territories Gazette, and a reasonable opportunity shall be afforded to interested persons to make representations to the Minister in respect of the proposed regulations. 4.3, no proposed regulation need be published more than once under subsection 4.2, whether or not it is altered or amended after such publication as a result of representations made by interested persons as provided in that subsection. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. Testart. I know it's late, but this is an important motion. Um, we have struggled with how best to uh, get it across to, to government that uh, there's an expectation that the public be involved in regulation making, at least to some degree. And what this calls for is a public notice period and the opportunity for the public to be involved. Now, initially we draft, well, I'll just stick to this motion because that, that's more correct. But in this case, it allows anyone to raise concerns around regulations being that an indigenous government, being that uh, it be industry, a civil society organization, or um, regular members of the public. Without this, the regulations will be uh, solely within the silos of the GNWT, and it will be the discretion of the minister who gets brought into that silo. And yes, there is a commitment through the, the devolution agreement, but as we found with this entire bill, industry was not adequately consulted. And as the vast majority of how this bill will play out is will be determined by regulations, I think it's imperative that there be some public provision. And finally, Mr. Chair, this exact section exists in the Petroleum Resources Act and the Oil uh, and the um, Oil and Gas Operations Act. So this is not a foreign concept to the GNWT. It exists within our statutory framework. It is required for regulations that will be brought forward for the oil and gas industry, and it should be identical with the mineral industry as well. And um, I'm, I won't presume what the minister will say, but I. I think based on what happened with the last thing, um, it's very important we, we be consistent with legislation as the minister has said previously in this hearing. And uh, to be consistent means passing this into the act. Thank you. Thank you. To the motion, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So, yeah, um, the minister did say that there needs to be some sort of discussion that happens about how regulation making is done this is the time and place to have that discussion, <laughs> right now. And 
what we've heard is a cabinet that is refuses to allow for any kind of public engagement, indigenous government involvement in the development of regulations. That's what we've heard consistently from this cabinet. They refuse to lay out what that process would look like. Even something as simple as this to provide some kind of public notice and an opportunity for comment, this sets out a, a process for, for that to happen. Um, why this is uh, so important is uh, there's a lot of significant public policy decisions that are gonna have to be made through the development of regulations. And right now, there's no process for that to happen where the public or even indigenous go governments have any engagement or involvement. You know, that's what our, our people expect of, of us, uh, that we're gonna do things openly and transparently, yet this cabinet refuses to allow for that to happen um, and make any kind of commitments around how that process should start to look. And I just don't understand this, what the reluctance is. Um, right now, the, the uh, regulations will be made at the sole discretion of the minister. This is not a government uh, initiative. This is at the sole discretion of the minister and or cabinet as laid out in this bill. That's who will be making the decisions around regulations. Um, so I, I just don't understand why the cabinet is so uh, stuck on this and refuses to allow any kind of public engagement and involvement in regulation making. I think it's bad uh, policy and uh, it's not consistent with consensus government. It's not the way we should be doing business. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Next, I have Mr. Simpson. Thank you. The practice laid out here is pretty much standard in most of Canada, so we're behind the times. We need to get with it. And I, I don't want to hear that uh, this is, needs to be part of a bigger discussion that we push off to the 19th Assembly. There's a lot of things that should have been pushed off to the 19th Assembly, or at least, you know, um, extended into it that aren't being done. So we can't have these sort of answers where, oh, this is convenient to leave for the 19th, but this we need to be done right now. So let's get with the times and uh, um, I'll be supporting this motion. Thank you. Okay, thank you to the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We cannot accept this motion. Again, this is a government-wide concern about a required broader political discussion. This specific bill is not in place. To have that discussion at an ad hoc basis, it would bring our legislation out of line with our existing legislation. Including this in the act will affect future government's ability to define and implement a consensus, consensus, con consistent process moving forward. As to uh, mirrored uh, uh, this, uh, the reference the member made to PRA and ROGA, this was mirrored in devolution. This was an anomaly because it was federal legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister does not concur with the amendment. The amendment will not take effect as a result. Committee to clause 111 as amended. Does committee agree? Clause 112 to 116. Does committee agree? Committee, that concludes the clauses. Mr. Simpson. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chair. I, I have a new clause here I would like to move. Mr. Chair, I move that Bill 34 be amended by adding the following after Clause 17. 17.1. 1. The Minister shall prepare an annual report under this Act that describes the following information. A. The total number of active restricted areas designated under Section 22B, the total number of active zones established under Section 24C, the total number of prospectors licenses issued under Section 26D, the total number of active recorded claims recorded under Section 28, E, the number of recorded claims recorded under Section 28 for that reporting year, F, the number of recorded claims suspended under Section 33 for that reporting year, G, the number of recorded claims cancelled under Section 33 for that reporting year. H, the total number of active mineral leases issued under Section 37. I, the number of mineral leases issued under Section 37 for that reporting year. J, the number of mineral leases renewed under Section 38 for that reporting year. K, the number of mineral leases cancelled under Section 39 for that reporting year. L, the total cost of work confirmed by the Department for that reporting year. M, the total number of active production licenses issued under Section 46. 
N, the number of production licenses issued under Section 46 for that reporting year. O, the number of benefit agreements entered into under Section 52 for that reporting year. P, the number of waivers made under subsection 52.3 for that reporting year. Q, the total number, rather, Q, the total amount of royalties paid to the government of the Northwest Territories under part six for that reporting year. R, the number of statistical returns submitted under section 60 for that reporting year. S, the number of convictions for offenses under part 10 for that reporting year. T, any other information that the minister considers necessary. Two, the minister shall table the annual report prepared under subsection one before the legislative assembly at the earliest opportunity after completion of the report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. The motion is in order to the motion. Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the motion speaks for itself. <laughs> Thank you to the motion. Question, question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with this amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to two, uh, sorry, committee to new clause 17.1. Does committee agree? Thank you. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So I move that paragraph 17.11Q of Bill 34 be amended by adding and a breakdown of the amount of royalties paid by each mine after under part six. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So what this clause is all about is the minister has now agreed to provide an aggregate amount in the annual report of the royalties that are paid uh, by mines across the Northwest Territories. So the purpose of this clause is to ask that uh, or require that that uh, disclosure include a breakdown of the royalties paid by each mine. Uh, this is not about delving into the financial workings of uh, each individual property. It's about what revenues this government gets under this uh, uh, piece of legislation from each mine as royalties. Um, this is becoming increasingly common across the world. There's an extractive industry transparency initiative um, that uh, numerous countries across the world have adopted and there's international standards that have developed around this. Um, indeed, federal legislation actually uh, is moving in that direction and requires self-reporting. There's issues around how that's done at the federal level in terms of the reporting period, it's self-reporting. There doesn't seem to be much in the way of quality assurance, quality control in the information that's submitted. Different companies report it in different ways. There doesn't seem to be any common understanding of the difference between fees and royalties. I'll leave it at that for the federal system. But I don't see any reason why our government cannot disclose uh, what royalties are paid by each mine. Not the calculations, just the amount. And uh, yes, I'll be interested to hear what the minister has to say uh, about this. Uh, this is consistent with public, our open government policy, trends around the world, and I think public disclosure, the public has the right to know what royalties are paid by each mine. So that's what this is about, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you. To the motion, Mr. Testart. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and while I am sympathetic to the need for greater transparency around the extractive um, industry sector in the Northwest Territories, I think that's a broader discussion that needs to be had, and this is premature. We know that um, there is a full fiscal and uh, or full financial natural resource review that's the, that will come forward, presumably, um, if the next government agrees to do it. And uh, the NWC is very unique in that uh, royal resource royalties are not the only source of revenues that government raises from the minerals industry in particular in this case, uh, but they also pay rents, 
They also have other fees that the government collects. So it's not all contained in the single issue of royalties. And I think um, to move this now, again, is premature given that we haven't had the chance to look at the a holistic picture of how our fiscal regime relates to the minerals industry and, uh, and then make decisions based off that finding. I do support transparency in the sector, but we've got to do it in a holistic way that takes into account our entire regulatory regime and policies and, that are in process. And at that time, I think it would be appropriate to bring amendments forward to the MRA and any other consequential amendments to the legislation that would be required. So at this time, I cannot support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you to the motion. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion, all those opposed? Abstaining. The motion is defeated. Committee to clause 17.1. This committee agree. Uh, sorry, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I move that sub clause 17.11 of Bill 34 be amended by adding the following after paragraph S. S.1. The number of inspections, investigations, and seizures under part 10 of that reporting year. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So this would amend the annual report uh, requirements uh, for the minister and simply add in some information about uh, the enforcement uh, that may take place under the, uh, this uh, legislation. And I would add that a very similar provision was added, or is now included in the uh, annual report requirements uh, for the Department of Lands, for lands that are administered under the Public Land Act. So we've already got that in that bill, and uh, um, that'll come to the floor of the House, of course, but uh, that's now incorporated in the bill as agreed to by the Minister of Lands, and I really would like to hear the Minister's justification. With, if he cannot concur with this, I'd like to hear the, uh, a detailed explanation. We've already got it in another piece of legislation. For the, the surface, let's do it for the, the subsurface. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. The motion is in order to the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Uh, does the, or sorry, the question, where am I? Sorry, <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Does the minister concur the with the amendment? <laughs> sorry, it's getting late. Do it we is con late. Do we concur with this? Yeah, uh, sorry. Does the minister concur with this amendment? Yes, we do. The minister, <laughs> the minister does concur. The minister does concur. All right, committee. Committee to... <laughs> anyone who want to go back and see? <laughs> All right. To or, call to order here, <laughs> committee to, to uh, new clause 17.1 uh, as amended. Does committee agree? Agreed. All right, good work. Mr. Testart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that Bill 34 be amended by adding the following after Clause 61, 61 -1 -1. Notwithstanding a person's right of access to information under subsection 5.1 of the Access to Information Protection and Privacy Act, the Minister may direct that the information not be disclosed under the Act or any under any provision of this Act that permits or requires information in any form to be provided or made accessible if A, the information is traditional knowledge and an Indigenous government or organization requests that the information not be disclosed, B, disclosure of the information could reasonably expected to have an effect described in paragraph 16 1a b or c of the access to information and protection and privacy act or c the information in its any information described in subsection 24 1 of the access to information and protection and privacy act to paragraph 1b applies regardless of whether or not the information has been in existence in a record for more than 15 years notwithstanding section 16 3 of the access to information and protection and privacy act 3 for greater certainty the exception to disclosure in subsection 1 applies in addition to the exceptions to disclosure under Division B of Part 1 of the Access to Information and Protection and Privacy Act. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Testart. The motion is in order to the motion. Question has been... Sorry, who did I have? Mr. Testart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This, uh, this amendment just clarifies the... Um, uh, uh, 
uh, right of, or uh, the mandatory disclosures that would otherwise be required by the Act, uh, because there are some proactive disclosure that's brought forward by the new editions of annual reporting and the public registry. So that leaves the minister in a difficult uh, situation if this amendment is not brought forward to protect the proprietary information of industry uh, and industrial actors and also the traditional knowledge of indigenous governments. So this is allowing um, uh, the minister to apply discretion to those disclosures. Um, it is quite broad, so I will caution that the minister will have to be very uh, judicious in his use of this power should this amendment carry, uh, because I think the intention is to ensure certain things that shouldn't be disclosed under ATIP aren't disclosed, but not a blanket uh, mandatory exception power. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Testar. To the motion, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, there was a lot of back and forth on this. I still have some difficulty understanding why a, uh, um, what do we call it here? Uh, whether uh, information that's in a record that's more than 15 years old, why the minister would need to have authority to withhold that. It seems like an exceptionally long time for me, but uh, I will uh, concede that this was a protracted set of negotiations with the department and this is about the best we could do. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with this amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to new clause 61-1. Does committee agree? agree. Thank you. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I move that Bill 34 be amended by adding the following after clause 64. 64.1. Decision of the majority of the members of the Mineral Rights Review Board assigned under subsection 63.1 is the decision of the Review Board. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The motion is in order to the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion is carried. Does the minister concur with this amendment? We accept. The minister concurs with this amendment. Thank you, minister. Committee to new clause 64.1. Does committee agree? Thank you. We will now return to the bill number and title, Bill 34, Mineral Resources Act. Does committee agree? Thank you. To the bill as a whole as amended, does committee agree? Thank you. Does the committee agree that Bill 34, Mineral Resources Act, is now ready for consideration in Committee of the Whole as amended? Mr. McNeely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Bill 34, Mineral Resources Act, be reported to the Assembly as ready for consideration in the Committee of the Whole as amended and reprinted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The motion is in order to the motion. Motion is in order to the motion. Agreed. Procedure. The motion is in order to the motion. Question. Question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Hmm? Motion is carried. Bill 34, the Mineral Resources Act will be reported to the Assembly as ready for consideration in Committee of the Whole as amended and reprinted. I want to thank you, Minister Schumann. Thank you to your officials. Do you have any closing remarks, Minister Schumann? Uh, thank you for committee for all their work and uh, we look forward to uh, the discussion on the floor of the House. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister. I will just say at this point in time I, that I do want to, uh, regardless of how sometimes the road appears to be bumpy, uh, that this bill has been before committee for um, a few months now. Uh, there's been some tremendous work done on behalf of uh, the committee while we've had the pleasure of having this in our hands. 
We have traveled extensively uh, up and down the valley with this bill and a number of others. There's been a number of contributors to this process, a number of stakeholders that have shared their important views. Uh, we have, uh, while it may not appear all the time, we have had a very collaborative and uh, good working relationship with the minister and the department. You came before us a couple times uh, when maybe you didn't even have to, so that was well appreciated. We've held public hearings. Um, We've, this is our second attempt at a clause by clause. So I think this is a really good example. While it, it showed strain at times, this is uh, an example to the public how much work and effort goes into actually work uh, making these laws uh, as best as we possibly can. We're not fully there yet. There's still some procedure to go through on the floor. But I think it's important to recognize that uh, committee, this is the end of committee's time with this bill now. And now it will go onto the floor where all members will have their say. And so I, I just really wanted to point out that this is an important thing for the public to be able to see. Um, it's fitting that we are actually doing this this evening in the great hall of the Legislative Assembly, the hall that's known for the, that this is the, the people's hall. And so I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank everybody once again for the contribution that they've made here this evening. And over the time that we've had this bill, it's been very much appreciated. And with that, we can be adjourned. Thank you.